Good morning. I'm Council Member Idenick Miller, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's hearing. I'd like to acknowledge uh, first some of my, the members of the committee, Council Member Danny Drum, Council Member Adrian Adams, and recognize my colleagues who are here to, who have joined us today uh, to speak on their legislation, Council Member Rafael Espinal and Council Member Brad Lander as well. Today's is a legislative hearing convened for the purpose of hearing num a number of bills and resolutions assigned to this committee, which I will briefly go through. First, my own bill, Introduction 1604. This introduction expands upon existing workers' compensation reporting law. Introduction 1604 requires that the city law department, instead of the mayor, to issue a report regarding workers' compensation across city agencies. The new reporting would include additional detailed information regarding workplace injuries and occupational disease, while also requiring every city agency to develop and implement a report on accident annual accidents and illness prevention programs. The purpose of these programs is to reduce workplace injuries and illness identified in the report. Workers' compensation represents a significant drain on our city's resources. In 2018, the total amount of claims paid was $24.9 million. While this is a decrease of 3% from 2017, it, is still it still represents a significant amount of taxpayer dollars spent. This bill would provide more effective data in an effort to reduce the injuries and illnesses that, will commonly, that will, we commonly see within specific industries and identify ways within the city in tackling these issues. To continue to see annual decreases in the number of claims filed and claims paid out. I look forward to working with the administration to see this bill come to law. I think that it will provide better data and allow the right policies to be implemented to mitigate these workplace injuries suffered by city employees and provide a safer working environment for all. The next piece of legislation we will be hearing is proposed introduction 1321A. It is sponsored by Council Member Espinal. This bill would expand prevailing wage law to cover building service employees in buildings where private developers receive at least $1 million in discretionary financial assistance from the city and the city's econ or the city's economic development entity for a city development project. This bill would remove the exemption of affordable housing projects and add the exemption, an exemption for certain supportive housing projects. While well, while well intentioned, I know this bill has created anxiety amongst the affordable and supportive housing community. And there are many advocates here today who will testify on this legislation. I expect to, I expect an extensive conversation about this bill in an effort to shape a bill that is impactful yet not harmful to those who provide necessary city services. The final piece of legislation that will be heard today is introduction number 108 by Council Member Brad Lander. This bill would prohibit employers from entering into non-compete agreements with freelance workers. The use of non-compete agreements and in, in, in contracts for freelance work, especially in fashion industry, can lead to unreasonable restrictions on freelance freelancers being able to find new work. This bill would prohibit such abusive practices for certain types of workers in New York City. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to these bills, we will be hearing from we will be hearing two resolutions. Resolution number 40, sponsored by Member Robert Carnegie, calls upon the New York State City Retirement NYSA to um, determine NYSA's members are disabled for the purposes of accidental disability pensions. If both the New York State Workers' Compensation Board and Social Security Administration determined that members are, dis in fact, disabled. Resolution 898, sponsored by myself, calls for New York State to adopt two state Senate bills and Assembly bill, better known, uh, uh, 2837 and 2750, better known as Farm Workers Fair Labor Practice Act. I am pleased to report that late yesterday, legislate, legislators passed a separate compromise measure with provisions that deliver on core principles of the original legislations, including time and a half for over 60 hours work 
affirmation of the right for farm, farm laborers to organize, offering farm laborers the option of the, the day, uh, day's rest, extends the state paid family leave law to farm laborers. There are approximately 80,000 farm workers working here in New York State alone. This law will ensure that these mostly immigrant laborers who have generally been undervalued and overworked and poorly compensated are provided with key protections and benefits that so many workers across this great state currently enjoy. Yes. Uh, long overdue, long, long overdue. I want to congratulate New York State Assemblywoman uh, uh, Kathy Nolan, um, who has worked, worked absolutely tirelessly over the past decade. We've been doing this as a, a sending this resolution up, as long as, as well as uh, Labor Committee Chair Senator Jessica Ramos for their perseverance in their leadership in making this Farm Laborers Fair Act uh, possible. We have a busy agenda today. I will, I will ask that the members of the public are called to testify when they are placing you. Uh, we will place you four to five persons to the panel, and we will be placing everyone on a three-minute clock. We want to hear from everyone today, so please be brief, concise, and we will accept your comments. Your written comments and testimony can also be submitted to staff. Uh, before I turn it over to the sponsors of the committee, I'd like to thank uh, my staff, my chief of staff, Ali Vasulunajab, Legislative Director Brandon Clark, Senior uh, Advisor Mr. Go Joe, Go Joe Goldblum, um, the great Joe Goldblum. And um, now, with that, I will. We will be hearing from. Uh, I also like to thank council staff. Uh, Malcolm, Kevin, Elizabeth, uh, and Kendall. They do an absolute fantastic job, not only in the Labor Committee, but throughout, and we appreciate the services there. We will now hear from Council Member Brad Lander. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm honored to be here at this hearing today on uh, your important bills, uh, which I think are great, and I look forward to hearing the testimony on. Um, I'm proud to be here today as the lead sponsor of Intro 108, which would protect New York City's freelancers. We were proud to become the first city in the country to pass the Freelancers and Free Act to protect freelancers from having their wages stolen after they'd already done the work and they didn't get paid. And in that process of developing the legislation, we heard from a number of freelancers, especially but not exclusively in the fashion industry, about the problem of being forced to sign non-compete agreements. So when they seek a hiring agency that is the one that gets them their work, that sends them out on shoots, uh, before that agency will sign them up, it requires them to sign a non-compete agreement, uh, but then won't guarantee them any significant amount of work. So now they're stuck. They can only work with one agency to go get work, and yet that agency does not have any obligations to give them enough work to earn a living, to pay their rent, to put food on the table for their family. So it's one more way that people are, who are independent workers and freelancers are denied some of the basic protections that workers should be able to expect. So at this hearing where we're talking about other ways of making sure that all workers have the opportunity to earn a living wage, um, I really appreciate, Mr. Chairman, that you made it possible for us to have this hearing to protect freelance workers from being forced to enter into unfair non-compete agreements. And I look forward to the testimony on it as well as on the other bills. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. We'll now hear from Councilmember Espinel. Thank you, Chair Miller, for holding uh, this hearing uh, on my bill, Intro 1321A, uh, which would expand the prevailing wage law for building service employees at city uh, development projects. A uh, minimum wage, as we all know, is no longer a living wage. As our city becomes a more expensive place to live, we have to be pushing for laws that close its wealth gap. I introduced this bill today because it is, a, it is the standard I set during the East New York rezoning. Of the 100% affordable housing that is being built in my district, each building is now going to provide prevailing wages to its staff. My district is facing a housing crisis just like the rest of the city. And this crisis has to be addressed not just by looking at how much affordable housing is available, but by examining what kind of jobs are available and can be created as well. There's no inherent contradiction between saying we know workers should be paid more and we know we need more affordable and supportive housing. I look forward to hearing all the testimony today so that we can pass legislation that addresses both of these goals. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Council Member. I want to thank my colleagues for, for the introductions of this thoughtful and absolutely necessary legislation that is before us today. With that, we will uh, call upon our first panel, uh, and that is Mindy Roller from Workers' Compensation Division of the Law Department, Suzanne Lynn from DCAS, Jacqueline Terlon from Citywide Office of Occupational Health and Safety, or I think I got that wrong, also DCAS, Michael Genovese of HBT Intergov, Casey uh, Adams, Department of Consumer Affairs, Workers' Protection, and Jill Maxwell from Consumer Affairs, Workers' Protection will now be sworn in by counsel. You can all raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth and answer all questions honestly before this council committee here today? And if you can just uh, press the mic. Uh... Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. My name is Mindy Roller, and I am the Chief of the Workers' Compensation Division of the New York City Law Department. The division administers workers' compensation claims of all city employees covered by the New York State Workers' Compensation Law. We also administer claims on behalf of the Department of Education, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the City University of New York. Approximately 200,000 municipal employees are subject to the workers' compensation law. I note that this does not include uniform members of the police department, fire department, sanitation department, or pedagogical employees of the Department of Education who are not covered by the law. The workers' compensation law provides benefits for private and public sector employees injured in the work course of their work activity. The benefits consist of all necessary medical treatment and partial wage replacement. The New York State Workers' Compensation Board, whose members are appointed by the governor, is charged with the res responsibility of administering the law on a statewide basis. The board adjudicates claims, issues decisions, makes awards of compensation, and holds hearings as appropriate. The board is the ultimate fact finder in co workers' compensation claims. The role of my division of the law department is to ensure that injured city employees receive the benefits to which they are entitled in the event of a work-related injury. All claims originate at the agency level, and each city agency is responsible for reporting its claims to the law department. The law department, in turn, populates state-required electronic forms and submits the claims to the board. The board determines how a claim proceeds, whether or not to hold a hearing or to issue a written decision, while the law department appears at hearings, reviews medical bills, and processes payments for wage replacement and medical treatment. As required by Administrative Code 12127, the law department also prepares an annual report of workers' compensation claims in May of each calendar year for the prior calendar year. This report tracks injuries and related payments made in that prior calendar year. It also lists injuries by agency with a description and location of the injury. In accordance with the statute, the report contains a snapshot of claims year by year rather than a cumulative total. Currently, the report is delivered to the mayor, comptroller, public advocate, and the city council speaker, and is posted on the Department of Records and Information Services website. In the most recent report for calendar year 2018, the division received approximately 18,100 new claims for compensation, appeared at 15,000 hearings, and reviewed nearly 300,000 medical bills. The payments listed in the annual report, almost 25 million in calendar year 2018, represent only a portion of the overall payments made that year. The division actually paid out during that past, this past fiscal year wage replacement payments totaling 33, rather $338 million and medical payments totaling $58.5 million. These payments represent all the active cases which the division administers, inclusive of payments for injuries incurred in prior years. We understand that the committee is now considering amending and expanding through intro 1604 the reporting requirements mandated by Administrative Code 12127. We commend the Council's concern for workplace safety and would like to take this opportunity to highlight and comment on a few of the proposed changes. First, the definition and addition of occupational disease as a separate category of claim is not useful or illuminating in this context. Currently, all claims reported to an agency whether for an accidental injury or occupational disease, are captured in the report. 
of great significance is that what qualifies as an occupational disease claim pursuant to the workers' compensation law is complex and the board's decisional law is variable. Moreover, whether a claim is deemed an accident or an occupational disease may not be determined until the claim is finalized and it may differ from the original claim. Because this information is already being provided, we would recommend not presenting occupational claims separately. Rather than clarity, it would result in confusion. Second, the requirement in proposed new paragraph C4 that agencies report the requested information as soon as practicable is too open-ended. To ensure that the report is created timely and efficiently, the law should prescribe a specific date which would allow sufficient time for the law department to collate all the results. We suggest February 15th of the year subsequent to the reporting. In addition to requiring a specific deadline, the bill should also require uniformity in agencies' reporting to be determined by the Workers' Compensation Division. Some of the reporting requirements in this bill do not capture the data in a way that would allow for meaningful reporting. This is particularly true of locations where an entry may have more than one identifier. As an example, an accident could be reported as having occurred in the municipal building or at one center street. We believe that reporting by county would be more informative. Of additional concern is that the proposed new subparagraph C53 references a category of claim reported but not filed, which is really almost non-existent. Virtually every claim reported to the law department by city agency is filed with the Workers' Compensation Board. Finally, these claims relate to health care and private health information. The inclusion of titles may, in some instances, serve to identify individuals with inappropriate specificity. This is one of the reasons that titles were not initially, initially included among the reporting requirements when this law was originally enacted. We recommend withdrawing the requirement that titles be included. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I would ha be happy to answer any questions. Good morning, Chairperson Miller and other members of the committee. My name is Suzanne Lynn, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs and General Counsel of the New York City Department of uh, Citywide Administrative Services. And joining me is Jacqueline Turlong, who is the Director of the Citywide Office of Occupational Safety and Health. The Citywide Office of Occupational Safety and Health, commonly known as COSH, is housed at DCAS within the office of the General Counsel. Essentially, COSH is an in-house resource for city agencies seeking to protect the health and safety of their employees. Among other things, COSH coordinates employee safety and health initiatives for all city agencies, provides technical assistance to agencies in implementing safety and health programs, and conducts environmental testing and monitoring within city agencies with the goal of reducing workplace hazards and worksite accidents. Last year, COSH conducted 21 trainings for 54 city agencies on topics ranging from right to know chemical safety, workplace violence prevention, indoor air quality, and thermal stress. In addition, COSH disseminates safety and health advisories and hosts town hall meetings during emergency events such as the 2014 Ebola outbreak, the 2016 Zika crisis, and the recent measles outbreak. COSH also conducts inspections of potentially hazardous situations in response to employees' concerns. For instance, if employees at a particular agency complain of the potential presence of asbestos in a worksite, COSH will send someone to inspect the premises. COSH staff are trained to inspect for lead, asbestos, air quality, and mold, as well as other conditions. If results of the inspection are positive, COSH will make recommendations to the agency about actions it can take to abate the condition. For instance, increasing air circulation or cleaning the premises with specialized green products. COSH also participates in a number of regularly scheduled meetings that give employees and their representatives a chance to raise their concerns to the appropriate parties. For instance, a video display terminal committee 
chaired by the director of COSH, which includes agency representat representatives from OLR, DOH, MH, HHC, and the labor unions, convenes monthly to establish citywide ergonomic standards with the goal of reducing musculoskeletal injuries. Further, COSH participates in quarterly labor management safety and health committee meetings to address workplace safety issues at the agency level. These meetings are attended by management staff from some of the larger agencies and labor union representatives and provide a forum for the unions to raise their members' concerns directly with management who can address them. Kosh serves as the primary liaison and reporter to the New York State Department of Labor's Public Employee Safety and Health Bureau, or PESH. PESH is the governing authority on occupational safety and health for city agencies and establishes and enforces regulations, as well as conducting periodic inspections to ensure that city agencies comply with federal and state regulatory requirements. Turning to intro 1604, section six of that bill would require city agencies to develop and implement annual accident and illness prevention programs designed to reduce injuries and illnesses. Many city agencies currently maintain safety and health programs that include accident and illness prevention components. These agencies include DEP, D DOT, DOHMH, and FDNY, among others. COSH evaluates employee safety and health programs and makes recommendations when needed. We support the goals of the bill and will continue to work with agencies to accomplish them. In addition, as part of their responsibilities, city agencies already conduct regular safety inspections at their work sites and investigate all accidents. Agencies must analyze accident investigations and submit information directly to the New York State Department of Labor on an annual basis. This information helps the agency, employees, and PESH evaluate the safety of a workplace, understand industry hazards, and implement employee protections to reduce and eliminate hazards, helping to prevent future worksite injuries and illnesses. I hope I have clarified the role that COSH plays in the city's efforts to safeguard the health and safety of its employees. COSH remains committed to continuing its work with city agencies to improve employee safety and health programs. We would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I am Genevieve Michael, Assistant Commissioner for Government Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on intro 1321A. The housing affordability crisis is multifaceted, and this administration is committed to tackling all its sides, including ensuring there is more and more affordable housing available for New Yorkers who need it most, and ensuring the city, through its housing programs, is spurring the creation of good-paying jobs that uplift residents. To this end, the mayor has advanced landmark policies for workers that have become models across the nation. In 2014, the city guaranteed paid sick and safe leave for all. In 2015, the city of New York was a key ally in the Albany fight to institute a $15 minimum wage. And in 2017, in partnership with this council, we passed fair scheduling laws that provide predictable scheduling and fair compensation for fast food and retail workers. Most recently, in this year's State of the City Address, the mayor announced ours would become the first city in the country to provide paid personal time for all workers and that all these efforts would come under the purview of a fortified agency called the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, formerly known as the Department of Consumer Affairs. In the midst of these tremendous strides to protect workers, HPD in 2017 also increased the already ambitious Housing New York goal to create or preserve 200,000 units of affordable housing to, even more to be even more ambitious, 300,000 affordable homes created or preserved by 2026, and I'm proud to say we are on track. Together, these worker protection and affordable housing production and preservation efforts are key pillars that support a broader strategy for building a fairer New York City, and they must be balanced to ensure that New Yorkers have both high quality jobs and affordable places to live. Uh, before diving into introduction 1321A, I wanna take a moment to describe the current landscape. Affordable housing development is a public-private partnership 
with developers putting in equity, financial institutions providing financing akin to mortgages, and the city providing gap financing to round out affordable projects. This role has allowed us to effectively use public subsidies in exchange for record levels of affordable housing production not seen anywhere else in the country. HPD's annual housing production is about 25,000 units per year, higher than anywhere else in the country. Uh, today, we estimate that about 15,000 of the 25,000 units we finance each year are already in buildings where staff are paid prevailing wages or are in a labor agreement. This is for a mix of reasons, including state law and city policy under this administration. These units include homes in larger buildings receiving 421A tax benefits, uh, a majority of our current larger preservation deals, uh, and all new construction and preservation in areas that have been rezoned as part of neighborhood scale rezoning since 2014. Buildings not currently covered by a prevailing wage requirement for building service workers tend to be smaller and often are deeply affordable. This should not be surprising. Smaller buildings often have smaller operating budgets and deeply affordable buildings earn less in rental income despite comparable per unit expenses to other buildings of similar size and thus are less likely to be able to accommodate higher operating expenses. I will now turn to the bill. Intro 1321A amends local law 27 of 2012 to require a prevailing wage commitment to any residential project with at least 100 units receiving $1 million or more of public financial assistance and includes a narrow exemption for certain types of supportive housing projects. Accordingly, this bill will apply to a broad range of HPD's projects, from deeply affordable new construction to preservation projects serving low-income seniors. We want to raise three primary issues balancing commitment to uh, sustainable, affordable housing and quality jobs. This administration is committed to ensuring more and more good quality jobs are created and supports the goals of this bill. We think it's important to move forward with an understanding of the best structure to balance the challenges of deepening our commitment to housing, the New Yorkers who need the most, and providing quality, high-wage jobs while doing so. From the launch of Housing New York in 2014 to March of 2019, HPD has helped create or preserve over 123,000 units of affordable housing, 40% of which has been accessible to families with the lowest incomes. We have reached these goals by consistently working with our partners to specifically target the families most in need, and we have restructured our programs to do that. For instance, the city has deepened its capital commitment to the Housing New York program to achieve these goals. Our partners have adjusted as well. We work with them to ensure they build or invest in buildings that create quality housing for our residents. In addition to the upfront capital investment, that quality comes with a certain level of annual operating cost. We must also remember that as we, as we work hard to serve more and more of our lowest income New Yorkers, building managers have less rental revenue to cover operating costs. Many buildings, like many homes, have more mortgage payments they must make. This means, all building cash flow, this means that building cash flow is increasingly getting smaller, putting the building at risk of being in financial distress, which brings risk of disrepair and ultimately bad conditions for tenants. We must work hard to achieve this balance to keep the threat of financial distress at bay. It gets increasingly difficult to do deals with developers and property managers if at the start of the conversation there are concerns about likely financial distress. Lenders and developers, many of whom share our mission and values, will begin to draw lines and establish the types of deals they may not do. This would jeopardize our overall ability to meet our housing goals. Our focus must be on striking the right balance for the subset of buildings vulnerable to this kind of risk. Uh, supportive housing pulls tenants with special needs from the shelter system and provides them with permanent affordable housing with on-site social services to address those needs. For decades, the supportive housing model has proven itself to be the most effective way to house and rehouse our neighbors in need of the most help. This successful model generally has more service staff on site, including security and maintenance workers. Uh, while HPD appreciates the council's intent to exempt supportive housing projects, HPD is concerned that the language in intro 1321A as written is too narrow to capture all supportive housing. The current text is structured to risk reflect HPD's supportive housing loan program term sheet, but would not cover, for example, supportive housing programs funded by New York State, and also would not give HPD flexibility to adjust affordability levels for the non-supportive units in these projects to serve other low-income New Yorkers. 
Uh, with no exemption for this type of housing, supportive housing providers estimate that a prevailing wage mandate could increase the cost of these services by over 75% in their buildings. For example, some advocates point to a 150 plus unit supportive project proposed in the Bronx, which would serve low income seniors and seniors suffering from severe mental illness. If intro 1321A applied to this development, the project would have a $6 million gap in additional capital funding to fill before it could move forward. Supportive housing is a significant component of this administration's turning the tide plan and commitment to reducing homelessness in New York City. NYC 1515 is the largest ever such municipal commitment of supportive housing. We want to ensure that this bill does not create unintended consequences that hinder our ability to provide this critical response. Um, HPD's ability to lock in affordability in mid-sized buildings and to implement our small loan programs should also be considered. Small to mid-sized projects for intro 1321 sets a threshold of buildings with 100 units for inclusion in the mandate and has a very broad definition of public financial assistance. However, HPD uses a variety of tools to reach mid-sized buildings to both address physical needs and to guarantee long-term affordability and accordingly, the choices faced by mid-sized buildings owners are different than those of larger building owners. Mid-sized building owners receive relatively modest benefits in exchange for provision of affordable housing. They face a different set of incentives than the developer of a larger new construction building, and when faced with too many regulatory requirements, are more likely to opt out of doing business with the city at all. In these cases, we lose on both labor and affordable housing goals. Uh, low subsidy projects. Similarly, this building could impact our ability to finance preservation projects that have relatively low subsidy amounts or that are only receiving tax exemptions with no additional subsidy. For example, our Green Housing Preservation Program term sheet allows a maximum subsidy of $50,000 per dwelling unit to finance energy efficiency and water conservation improvements and moderate rehabilitation. A 110-unit co-op building receiving $20,000 per dwelling unit from this program would not be exempt from the prevailing wage requirements under Intro 1321A. The increased cost imposed by this bill would disincentivize these owners from working with HPD, particularly if they are able to access private financing to undertake necessary repair work. In turn, we lose the opportunity to get such buildings into regulatory agreements and preserve long-term affordability and viability. HPD preliminarily estimates that raising the exemption threshold to 200 units per project could ensure that we could that we could not uh, that we could not lose these much needed affordable units in mid-sized buildings. Uh, I want to end by reiterating HPD's commitment to both quality jobs and affordable housing. Both are essential for New Yorkers and for a sustainable, fair city. These goals can be achieved together. As we work on all fronts to stem the tide of the affordability crisis, we look forward to partnering with the city council, advocates, and labor unions to craft a solution that balances these critical needs. Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Casey Adams, and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, which was recently renamed the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I am joined today by Jill Maxwell, Legal and Policy Director for the DCWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Laura Lee Salas about Introduction 108, a bill that would prohibit hiring parties from requiring freelancers to enter non-compete agreements without compensation. DCWP supports the goal of this bill, and we look forward to working with the Council to ensure that Intro 108 builds upon the existing Freelance Isn't Free Act framework to better protect workers. The Freelance Isn't Free Act was signed into law by Mayor de Blasio in November 2016 and took effect in May 2017. The law establishes and enhances protections for freelance workers and is the only law of its kind in the nation, as sponsor uh, Councilmember Lander noted in his opening remarks. Under the Act, freelancers have the right to a written contract for work worth $800 or more, timely payment, and damages and attorney's fees in successful suits for non-payment and other violations of the Act. The Act also protects against retaliation for the exercise of protected rights. Freelancers have access to DCWP's court navigation program, where full-time navigators can assist by responding to general inquiries about the law, conducting initial consultations, guiding freelancers through the civil court process, and accepting complaints to start the formal administrative complaint procedure established by the law. 
If a freelancer files a complaint with DCWP, we promptly notify the hiring party who must respond within 20 days. This process can motivate hiring parties to resolve disputes amicably before a claim is filed in state court. Freelancers can also file a private lawsuit in state court with or without having gone through the DCWP's administrative process or court navigation program. DCWP is proud of the results we have achieved for freelancers in the two years since the Freelancers in Free Act first took effect. In May 2018, DCWP released Demanding Rights in an On-Demand Economy, key findings from year one of NYC's Freelancers in Free Act, uh, copies of which have been provided to all the members of the committee today. This report showed that the majority of freelancers who used DCWP's navigation program in its first year secured payment from their hiring parties. Most complainants who secured payment did not need to pursue their claim in court, and the complainants come from a wide range of industries and occupations. Demanding rights also found that freelancers who file complaints report a high level of satisfaction with the navigation program. DCW will use information gathered from surveys and reports like this one to continue to refine and improve our implementation of the law. The Act's success has continued into this year. Through May 2019, DCWP has received more than 930 complaints from freelancers and fielded almost 600 inquiries about the law. The most common allegations are related to payment violations, including late payment and non-payment for services. In that same period, DCA has assisted more than 300 freelancers in recovering more than $1,100,000 in lost wages, with an average recovery of $3,213 per freelancer. We believe that the success of the Act's first two years serves to show that the law is working and that freelancers are being educated and empowered to enforce their rights and, importantly, paid for their work. DCWP supports the goal of regulating non-compete agreements in freelancer contracts. Freelancers lack the job security of traditional employees, and it is often important for freelancers to be able to seek work from a broad client base, both during contracts or shortly after they conclude, in order to support themselves. Non-compete agreements severely restrict a freelancer's ability to find work, especially in concentrated industries where most hiring parties are in competition. Unfortunately, some freelancers may feel powerless to push back on the inclusion of a non-compete agreement in their contract, even if it does harm their ability to find other work, because the practice is seen as standard in their industry or because the hiring party has more bargaining power in that situation. DCWP looks forward to working with the Council to ensure that Intro 108 protects freelancers while building on the framework and services successfully established by the Act. We believe that these protections would be more effective and complementary to the Act if they, were more in, if they were incorporated as an amendment rather than added as a freestanding regulation. Requirements related to non-compete agreements should be integrated into the existing structure for freelancers, which educates and empowers these workers to enforce their rights through a private right of action and provides for a ta tailored complaint process at DCWP. Instead of requiring DCWT to establish and develop a new enforcement procedure, this approach would pr recognize the success already achieved by the Act and seek to expand upon it. DCWP also feels that additional research is needed to ensure that the new regulations on non-compete agreements do not inadvertently undermine existing state common law safeguards related to the purpose and scope of such agreements. The Law Department is currently reviewing the legislation for this and other reasons. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, uh, and I'm now happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. So um, while we have the administration here covering uh, with the knowledge and resources to address certainly all three bills, we're kind of, we're, we're kind of going to go back and forth. And um, I know some of my colleagues, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that they get to the mic. But I do want to kind of start out with, with, with my bill and uh, the workers' compensation and, and ask a few questions there about, I'd like to begin with um, how how is it different? How does this bill um, that is being introduced differ from how data is currently being collected and used? I think that this bill seems to be requested. Sorry about that. Sure. It seems to me that this bill is requesting additional data points. I don't think it changes anything in the way of 
collecting or reporting the data? So this bill specifically asks not necessarily the, the, the reporting. Well, for, first of all, it asks not that, that, that workers comp specifically reports the data, but, but secondly, that the data is used to, um, so we were talking about Kosh and their, and, 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 and their um, responsibilities in, in the workforce world um, uh, and how they are charged with uh, keeping uh, workforce um, safe. But it, it, it appears to me based on the testimony that I've heard that what they're doing is, is kind of generic based on things that may impact an entire workforce. And what we are attempting to do here is to identify specific workforce, workplace hazards that contribute to workers' compensation or workplace injuries. How then, are, is there any data to support that it is being given to specific agencies to address specific injuries, which is why we're asking for the data to be presented in, in that manner. Well, I just want to speak first uh, to say that the agencies themselves actually do have this information since they would be providing it to us. Um, and I think it's certainly valuable for them to review it and create workplace safety um, programs as a result of the, the information provided. Um, Council member, if I can just address the, uh, what COSH does. Um, what, what COSH really does, a, a lot of what COSH does is really to work with individual agencies to help them if they're, if they're requested by the agency to help, um, to look at what is going on at their agency, to analyze their data and to create programs specifically for the needs of that agency because every agency, as you know, is different. So it's, Kosh does do a lot of citywide trainings, et cetera, which I think you were referring to, but it also does a lot of work with individual agencies to help them craft their programs. Can you be specific? Sure, I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie Turlong to give you a couple of examples of such programs with the agencies. So one particular agency is the Workplace Prevention Program. In that scope of work, a safety and health coordinator, each agency has a safety and health coordinator, and that individual is in charge of maintaining and establishing a safety and health program. In the these particular workplace violence arena, the safety and health coordinator would conduct what's called a risk assessment and would walk around to determine what hazards exist in a workplace and then design measures to protect the worker. Once that is established, policies are written and the employee by the agency and employees are trained on those procedures annual review is performed uh, with members of both labor, labor relations, labor unions, and the city agency in order to ensure that the appropriate measures have been designed in order to ensure worker protection. I, I, I certainly get and, in, and, and understand the intent, but can you be specific as to what agencies have come up by virtue of, of, of uh, these um, health and safety committees, these joint labor management health and safety committees that these suggestions have been taken, applied, and have been utilized to mitigate workplace safety. And that we can show through the workers' comp data that we've been able to mitigate some, some ongoing workplace uh, environmental safety issues. So I can give a clear example of the Department of Transportation. Uh, there have been instances, number of instances, where employees have reported exposure to chemicals um, and have reported sensitivity. Uh, in those instances, our office has have collaborated with the safety and health unit. We've conducted air monitoring in those locations to test whether or not there are any contaminants in the air. Uh, we've 
provided recommendations to their facility units uh, to balance the air, um, as well as ensure that the facilities department has designs and operations and maintenance plan uh, to ensure that there's routine monitoring of those systems. And then the employees are encouraged to report if there are any uh, reoccurring issues to address any potential workplace uh, incidents, I should say. And, and, and those are almost cat catastrophic experiences that, that workers may in, incur. But on, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what are we seeing? Because um, it's interesting that you mentioned DOT because I think according to the data, they have the highest number of, of workers' comp claims or at least a top, well, certainly their top five um, amongst those city agencies. And, and, and so, and, and, and are you working with uh, those organized labor bargaining units that represent those committees as well, are they a part of these? And are we utilizing the data that comes from workers' compensation and beyond workers' compensation? Because what we're talking about now is being able to uh, mitigate not just costs, but, but long-term sustained injuries by workers. And so in doing so, what's not captured in this um, legislation is, is the uniform workforce, right? And what is the relationship with the uniform workforce? And what are we doing to make sure that whether it is equipment, it is how services are performed and things of that nature there, yeah. that we are able to make sure that we are creating the safest work environment for all of our workers. So in, in the case of uniform workers, our office does not work directly with uniform workers. But to touch on the comments you made earlier, um, we can go back to Department of Transportation. Uh, there are quarterly meetings uh, with representatives of DOT's management, as well as COSH and labor unions that do in fact review agency incidents and then address any concerns raised either by the employee or the labor union. So because DOT has a high number of claims, would, would you submit that most of them are based on what you said there about some of the, uh, uh, so based on what you said in terms about the, uh, the, the, um, the exposure, chemical and other exposure, is that the majority of those claims? I wouldn't be able to speak on what the claims are. So workers' comp, that, that you have that data there and, and, and that um, certainly DOT is one of the leading agencies. Um, what specifically, where are those claims coming from? Have you been able to identify that, considering that that is the nexus of this legislation to be able to identify and, 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 and mitigate those circumstances that potentially injure workers? I, it would be impossible for me to really speculate as to specifically which type of claims are, are um, you, you know, causing the, this particular jump. In because if you look at it carefully, their claims, it's not really the number of cases that's only that's jumped so significantly, but the value of the cases as well. The financial increase has been dramatic. Um, we've noticed it. We generally reach out to agencies to try to discuss this with them, but in terms of speculating as to specific uh, causes, I, it would be speculative on my part. Okay. Um. How many agencies participate in, in COSH? Not how many, I know that they're all potentially can, how many are actually participating? Well, as uh, I said in my testimony, last year, Kosh conducted 21 trainings and they were attended by 54 discrete agencies. That would include the vast majority of which were mayoral agencies, but also included some cultural institutions and some offices of elected officials as well. And, and again, how many of those 21 trainings were specific to specific industry training to address uh, mitigation of, of workplace injuries? All of them. They, 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 all of the trainings 
touch on that subject to some degree. Can I be more specific here? Because sure. I think we're, we're, we're not. Uh, maybe. So, so I'm a lifeline, a lifetime civil servant myself, right? And uh, of course, many different agencies. Last year, last year, I, I had a surgery. I had a cervical triple disectomy fusion, right? Which was caused by over the road reverberation and other things, right? That are very systemic to to driving trucks and buses and anything over the road and things of that nature there, right? That is something that is easily identifiable, right? When you go back and you look at claims and there are a number of claims for that have back and knee and neck injuries for a specific injury. That's low hanging fruit. What we are asking you all to go into each agency and be able to identify that low hanging fruit so that people don't have these specific conditions. Have to live their lives in in, in agonizing pain, right? And and which is the case that happens more than more in, in, in many cases, and 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 because um, we are not necessarily identifying these uh, industry um, habits and that contribute to these things. Um, they continue to manifest themselves, and so that's what we're saying. How do we, how do we how do we look at specific injuries? And, and I'm sorry, industries and injuries, and then be able to take this data and, and mitigate that. So I'd I'd like to start off by saying that the agencies are are taking the charge of designing customized programs. And the foundation of every safety and health program involves what's called a job hazard analysis. And Kosh has uh, taken great efforts in order to ensure that agencies are using this process as the foundation of safety and health programs. Um, in the case that you just mentioned, a job hazard analysis looks at the worker, either the title or the job function, and then evaluates what the hazards are specifically to that job title or job function, and then comes up with specific systems in order to protect the worker. Those systems can include developing specific standard operating procedures. In the case of driving, it may be that you need to take breaks. Um, also, we may make recommendations with the hazard to develop specific personal protective equipments. In some cases, employees need to wear gloves. And then the final piece is whether or not there are any barrier protections to separate or isolate the employee from that particular job function. The final piece is to develop a policy in order to serve as the reference for the employee and then design appropriate training material so that the employee can follow a plan in order to ensure protection. So, so I, I just use my case as an example, but having been obviously a trained safety officer and all that background and that stuff there, I visited actually a city yard uh, last week and, and often I have an opportunity to do that and, and I look at the equipment that has not changed, the ergonomics of the equipment that has not changed for years, that there are standard within industry air seats that happen that don't exist in many, many of the trucks and, and equipment that exists within the city that is a standard um, um, contributor to, to things like over the, over the road reverberation and, and neck and back injuries and so forth. That has not happened. As I look at what protects even the customer and consumer and in and, and according with um, the council's vision zeros mandates and legislation, the only thing that has been changed is what has been mandated to, for change by this council. The mirrors that happen uh, continue to, they look exactly the same, and that's a problem. Not only is it endangering mm -hmm. the pedestrians, but in order to, for, for those drivers to, to mitigate those blind spots, they are taught and required to lean in and out 50, 100 times a day. All that is unnatural on the spine. All of that is preventive if there was a proper investment in the proper mirrors, the proper seating, and things of that nature there. 
how do we use this information and data, capture that to, to make a, create a better work environment for workers, which is kind of the purpose of what we're talking about here. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not sure that we're getting that. And if, if, if you are, um, how then have we used this data in the past to create a better work environment for, for those agencies that have engaged Kosh, because obviously everybody's not, and, and there's also a charge for, for um, agencies to keep workers' compensation numbers down. So I want to talk about that, and then I, I want to have uh, Council Member Espinal, in the interest of time, to jump in and talk about his bill. But I do want to stay on that and, and, and talk about um, claims, um, claims that had, had, we saw a 17% increase in claims two years ago, and then a, a kind of a, a sharp dive in a two and a half percent. Where's that coming from? How do we achieve that? And what work was been, has been done? Any of that attributed to what we're talking about today? Um, to the extent there's an explanation, I think there are a variety of reasons why it might have occurred. It would, again, be speculative on my part to suggest what they might be. Um, we do notice the trends, we do pay attention to them, and we work in collaboration with the agencies um, in terms of administering the claims. I would say that there is not necessarily, there's, the goal is to reduce workplace injuries generally, um, but that's not the, my division's mandate. My division's mandate is to provide workers' compensation benefits to make sure that injured employees get their medical treatment as quickly as possible and their wage replacement similarly as quickly as possible. Um, but in terms, I think really uh, the, the onus of this, and I think it's an admirable goal, is to really, is with the agencies. They understand the nature of their workforce, the nature of the jobs, and this, this information comes from the agencies. If you want it reported uniformly to return to them, I understand that. But ultimately, I think even this amendment indicates, and correctly so, that it rests with the agencies to supervise and oversee their own workplace um, health and safety prevention program. So right now, you guys are charged with the, the reporting aspect of that now. So that's, that's what kind of why we're bringing it to you. Plus, you have the information of, of all the agencies who can do that. Aside from that, how, how, how benefits get paid in a timely fashion and, and people get back to work, um, that's a whole other hearing. I, I would submit that that's not the case either. So we can talk about how many cases were actually controverted um, and, and, and how many actual claims were paid, that's something totally different that may increase these numbers as well. But we're not here to talk about that. We just said that we want to narrow it down to something more specific. Um, with that being said, we want to hear from Council Member Espinal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to let me uh, get in a few words. Um, I guess my question is to HPD. Um, in, in regards to uh, the bill, so the, the agency and administration currently is against the bill as it's written. Uh, I think we are supportive of the goals of the bill, but you know, devils in the details want to make sure that we strike the right balance. So the the, the city is currently uh, already under underwriting um, prevailing wages and in, in affordable housing projects in districts like mine and other districts that that were rezoned. Uh, wh what is the argument ag against um, applying that same policy across the city when we also can make the argument that uh, a lot of the affordable housing that's going to be built over the next few years will be in these areas? Uh, yeah, of course. So thank you for the question. And of course, uh, thank you for your partnership on the East New York rezoning. Um, you know, we, this administration made a commitment to underwriting to prevailing wage in the rezoning areas, as you noted. I think, you know, that those have been specific areas where the city across policy areas has been making, you know, considerable financial commitment. Um, so we have been able to do that, you know, for those projects. I think the concern about scaling that uh, citywide is, you know, just a question of, you know, both cost 
and uh, limiting some of the flexibility on the financing on those projects. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I can, you know, step back a little bit to talk about how HPD finances affordable housing um, and how the private-public partnership works for us. Uh, you know, private developer is approaching us either because they own uh, private land or if we are financing a project on publicly owned land, uh, they will then, you know, attract finan private financing for that project. Um, if either, you know, the rents are low and there is a gap in that net operating income or the cost of managing that building is higher and that creates a further gap, then HPD is gonna provide extra subsidy up front to cover that gap. Um, you know, so I think underwriting all of our projects citywide to prevailing wage is just going to, you know, add a, a pretty considerable increased cost across the board. Um, I think we've been able to make that work in the rezoning areas, but certainly have concern about scaling up citywide. Um, I also, you know, do want to know, uh, because in the rezoning areas it does apply to both uh, new construction and preservation, that in light of rent regulation, uh, changes which passed la last week, um, you know, certainly join the administration in, you know, championing and being very excited about those changes. I think it is a huge win for tenants. We still have some analysis left to do about what that's going to mean uh, cost-wise on our projects. I think that's going to be, you know, true in the rezoning areas and true across the board. So want to be uh, careful about the directions that we are moving in while we do that analysis. So I, I guess what I'm hearing is that the cost, of course, is, is, a, big, is a big concern. Um, so would you say that uh, in order to get prevailing wage into projects, these projects are going to need more capital money up Correct. front? Correct. Correct. Now, are, aren't there ways where we can uh, look at uh, the underwriting assumptions and make certain tweaks that in, in the front end, uh, the cost of the project can, can, be, can really get, we get a real like, analysis of what the cost of the project will be in, in the back end so we can be able to pay for these uh, uh, wages? Yeah, I think, you know, as an agency, we are always looking on a project-by-project project basis for ways to value engineer and make sure that we are really getting the best bang for our buck um, and, you know, spreading our subsidy as far as it can go. I think, you know, that's where the concern about, you know, the legislation that's drafted comes in. I think, you know, again, we can make it work project by project here and there, but doing it whole scale across the whole portfolio is what raises concerns. Well, one of the whole scale things that uh, that, that is taken into account for these projects is, is a 5% vacancy rate, mm -hmm. right? Um, do, does the administration really believe that there is a 5% vacancy rate in, in affordable housing uh, in our city, across the city right now? Um, so. The 5% vacancy rate, and certainly appreciate the question and the, you know, creative uh, thinking there. Uh, the 5% vacancy rate actually does not come from HPD. That's a industry-wide standard. Um, as I mentioned, you know, where we are financing these projects, we are dependent on um, private investors lending money to developers. They underwrite to 5%. I think we have, you know, explored whether or not there is flexibility there. Um, you know, frankly, I don't think that there is, although happy to have further conversations, and do just, you know, want to flag there that when they look at 5% vacancy, they aren't just assuming, you know, if an apartment is physically vacant, they also are taking into account whether or not there's going to be, you know, tenants who maybe aren't paying their rent on time or something like that, and that's how they arrive at that 5% standard. Um. Just give me one second. Uh, so the, the mayor also uh, made a commitment, right, um, originally to build 200,000 affordable housing units. Uh, he upped that number to 300,000 um, mm -hmm. and called it an ambitious goal. Uh, was there any thought uh, when those numbers were increased about how can we create good paying jobs instead of just looking at maximizing affordable housing units? You know, I think this administration is always looking for ways, again, to both meet our affordable housing goals while also creating quality jobs. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned, those are both, you know, key goals that we have, and it's about striking that balance. Um, I can't speak to the specifics of how that goal was changed, but I know that it's always front of mind for this administration. I think it would have been a welcomed, uh, uh, I think, uh, a welcomed approach to, to look at how we could have created more prevailing wage jobs uh, instead of just you know throwing a, a number of 300,000 units without taking into account that, that that was a real opportunity also to create 
uh, good paying jobs. Uh, the mayor also committed to uh, creating 100,000 uh, over 100,000 good paying jobs in our city. Uh, I think that this would have been an opportunity to do that as well. And this con currently can still be an opportunity to do that. Uh, so I I'm gonna continue pushing uh, for this bill. I, I hear the concerns, but I, I think that there are creative ways for us to move forward uh, for, for the reasons that I mentioned before of it working in these major citywide rezonings. Um, so uh, we look forward to continue the conversation. Absolutely, we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. If I, if I may, just a moment while we have HPD in, in, in queue there. Um, how, how many affordable uh, projects are in queue to happen now? Uh, so our goal right now is to uh, finance 25,000 units of affordable housing every year between now and 2026. You know, the number of projects sort of varies year to year depending on project size. Um, you know, I, I think it's roughly, uh, you know, if you exclude 40, 421A standalone projects and some of our smaller uh, home ownership loans, I think it's roughly 150 projects. 150 projects. Yeah. And of, of those 150 projects, uh, they vary throughout the city, right? Yep. And you said that the, the ability to, to be able to capture uh, prevailing wage is, is, is more on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. And so that would be kind of the, the administration's um, concern as, as they move forward that it couldn't be done universally is it is if 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 it were a mandate is is it is there a benefit to having um a multitude of developers uh, or a lesser number but more qualified developers is it clearly uh when you compensate people appropriately you you, you kind of get uh more experience uh and, and uh, a greater level of expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I mean, is that a concern as well? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think also do just want to, you know, point specifically to the preservation projects, um, because in those cases, we are really dependent on landlords or property owners coming to us and looking to, you know, negotiate a preservation deal. And I think, you know, one, we are happy to see that actually in the majority of the larger preservation projects we do. We've worked you know, closely in this and doing this analysis with 32BJ. A lot of those buildings do already have uh, labor agreements. And of course, mm -hmm. as we are financing those projects, we are very respectful and supportive of those agreements. Um, but I think our concern for some of those mid-level size buildings that you know, might be a smaller owner, might have less, um, you know, they might have less sophistication in working with the city and might not want to come work with us as there are more requirements on them to do so. So I think, you know, and we can't, you know, it's one thing, you know, with developers that we're working with either on RFP sites where we have, you know, a little bit more control there, but certainly with existing buildings that are approaching us for preservation deals, we need to be able to work with a wide range of property owners in order to provide those existing tenants with the protections that they need. So, so would HPD be willing to bring this plethora of, of experience and resources to the table as we kind of hash through this legislation that, to figure out how we ensure that as many that we capture as many of our target audience in, in making sure that workers um, have proper compensation for the skills and the, and the work that they, and the services that are being delivered. Um, yes, uh, are, yeah. are we willing to do that? Absolutely, I think, you know, HPD, you know, from the top on down is certainly ready to continue conversations, I think both with labor and with the council. Okay, thank you. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Genevieve. We're working you out today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll spend all day together. <laughs> all day together. Uh, I, too, am a sponsor of uh, 1321A, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. In your testimony, you spoke a lot about financial distress for developers and managers, so I'm glad that we're having the conversation around wages uh, and employment. Uh, as it pertains to the workers around the buildings and around the development of these projects. How are added costs for wages and benefits covered within a development budget? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, at the start of a project, when we are either sizing a loan or looking at subsidy, we are thinking about what the operating expenses of that building is going to be over the lifetime of that building and certainly over the lifetime of our regulatory agreement with that building. Um, so, you know, if we are seeing that we're trying to set rents at a certain amount, you know, to serve the New Yorkers who need it the most, that's obviously going to impact that operating income. And as we are um, encouraging higher wages, that's also going to take away from that net operating income. And so when, we, when uh, private developers are working with banks to provide financing, that means the, those financial institutions are going to provide a smaller loan for the period of time because you know, they know that that developer is going, to be able, is going to be generating less income, which means upfront HPD has to provide more capital in order to make the financing pen out and to allow us to actually be able to close the deal. I think just you know, by way of example, we estimate it's about, it is $9,300 per unit that we need to, to add for prevailing wage for building service workers. Okay, so along those same lines, do you foresee the cost of this legislation, uh, 321A, um, decreasing the amount of affordable units created? You know, so I, I think, as I said, we think it is $9,300 per unit. I think, you know, this administration is really committed uh, to hitting that 300,000 unit mark. So I think, you know, we would have to figure out how to move forward if the bill passed as is. I think it is more likely that it would have an impact on our ability to do, you know, housing for the lowest income New Yorkers as opposed to actually taking units offline. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, just to add to that, I you know, do have concerns about uh, preservation projects where developers who otherwise would have come to us might not want to come to us. All right. I'll, I'll ask one more question around this, the same subject. We're talking about um, low-income neighborhoods. How much of the affordable housing built in low-income neighborhoods would you say is available to residents of the local neighborhoods? Yeah, so um, I don't have those exact numbers in front of me, can certainly follow up with you, but I think, you know, of the 123,000 units uh, we have built so far under the housing plan, 40% are available to the lowest income New Yorkers, but again, happy to, uh, you know, follow up with more details with you. Okay, I, I just think that it's a, a really uh, significant concern that, um, that HPD and Housing New York do not contradict what we're setting out to do, and that is to build affordable housing, but we want to be able to supply the employment opportunities for those that need affordable mm -hmm. housing the most. Yep, I think that is absolutely a shared goal, and we look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Councilman Belander. Thanks very much, and um, I'll start with my questions on 1321A since they build here, and then I'll ask about 108. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I think getting some clarity on the numbers is, is really what we need, and, and though you said it, I don't think it's in your written testimony, and it would be really helpful for us to understand the numbers we're talking about, and it seems to me that's like clarity on what we think the additional capital subsidy is, what percent that is of the average subsidy per unit, yep. um, but then also on the other side, what we think the difference it means in a worker's kind of life is, because that, I guess $9,300, so one time upfront capital cost, but it's buying us uh, the prevailing wage package for the life of the project. So we're talking, I assume, over a 30 year span, what that means in the wages, benefits, and retirement security of the workers. So I guess I want to start there. Does HPD have a sense, you, you talked a little about what's in the portfolio, of like the, the difference between what a worker in the prevailing wage project for building service work is make is earning and what their health and retirement package is. And obviously we'll ask some of the workers and, and the union as well, but we ought to, you know, we gotta look at both sides of the ledger here. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we, in our underwriting, we underwrite for a super to about $56,000 per year as the annual salary. Uh, for a porter, it's $44,000 a year uh, for their salary. Um, you know, I would obviously defer to uh, both 32BJ and controller's office who sets prevailing wage for, you know, those specific changes. I know it is 
you know, sometimes Th those are yeah. what you underwrite too but in that's the prevailing what we underwrite wage today. projects Sorry, or in the non-prevailing that wage is projects. in the non-prevailing wage okay projects. and in the yeah. prevailing wage projects what do you underwrite too? um so my understanding and again we'll defer to 32bj and of course the controller's office sets prevailing wage that we underwrite to um is that a super is at 91 about roughly 91,000, and a porter is at 86,000. And that's both salary and benefits and retirement contributions. Uh, yeah, that is my understanding. All in package. Um, so, yeah. from the 56 and 44, we would need to understand what was what was benefits as well if we wanted to figure out what they were actually earning per year. Yep, and you know, of course, important to note that uh, for the supers, they are obviously receiving uh, housing as well as part of that compensation package, which is not you know included in uh, the co the salary cost that we are underwriting to. Okay, so we'll dig in a little more. I think getting perspective from the workers will help us really understand, you know, you know, for, 44 doesn't sound so bad, but if then you're backing out whatever benefits there are, you know, mm -hmm. pretty soon we're going to have people like, if you made $44,000 a year and you were a porter and you didn't have a, a unit, like wh what unit of HPDs would you qualify for? Yeah, so I... I Anticipated I would ask that question. We do have these uh, good AMI <laughs> cards. Um, so I think uh, for... A, uh, I think for a family of three, six, it would be about 60% of AMI. Okay, so if you're a porter in one of our buildings, you, you have to apply for what we call low-income housing and produce not anywhere near enough units of if you want to have an affordable place to live in the city. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the housing plan certainly is generating um, units at a variety of ranges, um, so I think it would fit in here, but yes. But, I mean, it's, do you agree it's a bad idea to create jobs that we know in advance require you to find a different affordable housing subsidized unit when we could for the other 9,300 bucks boost people up to a place where they wouldn't, wouldn't need that same affordable housing subsidy on top of their job. Yeah, I, I think certainly here the concern, I think, you know, what we have been focused on is trying to strike that balance um, between, you know, creating and preserving the number of it, affordable housing units we need to solve that crisis. But I it think, costs you know, what it costs. So, yeah. I, you know, I think with this, I'm just trying to get it all the data out there. Yep, like no totally. one's trying to pretend away the extra money that it costs to build into the subsidy. Uh, in order to do it, but all right, so that's helpful. I guess because my last piece of data here, and, and I appreciate what you've given us so far. Um, uh, what is the average? And I know it's obviously a range depending on the on the program. So if you want to give me one average or some program numbers, the average subsidy per unit in some of our in some of our programs. Um, it really depends, uh, you know, based on the term sheet. Um, you know, I think it's pro roughly around $150,000 a unit, but I, you know, want to get back to you with specifics there. Okay. So, but, you know, what we're talking about here, I mean, you know, it adds up if you're trying to produce 300,000 yep. units, but, you know, we're talking about something that is, is well under 10% of the average cost for, uh, in subsidy per unit. Uh, yeah, I think that's. I think it is close to ten percent. Yeah, just you know, well, ninety three hundred out of one hundred fifty thousand you know, is not close to. 10%. Yeah, I think. I mean, it just depends on obviously the term sheet. I think some of them are one fifty. I know some are much lower, particularly when we are looking at our preservation deals, like the you know green preservation loan program I mentioned in my testimony is you know much close a fifty thousand dollar cap. A lot of those are much lower. Um, so I think we certainly could have conversations. But. Yeah. but but it's true that the the developments that have substantially lower capital subsidies tend not to be the overwhelmingly very low income housing and so therefore their operating budgets on average are higher. I think still on the you know existing preservation deals that are coming to us, you know we might not be putting in as much money up cost uh, up front to help finance the new construction, um, but those those buildings certainly often are going to have um, limited cash flow. Okay. And I think, you know, again, do you want to reiterate that we want to do that analysis based on so, that? And I guess so I'll just end on, on this point. If you're doing additional analysis that really is looking at some different model deal types, that would be really helpful to us in understanding, um, you know, what the real cost is and, and what the real impact yep, is. Yep, so. absolutely. All right, thank you. Just a couple of very quick questions on 108 because I think the administration's testimony uh, has a lot of useful things in it. I'm glad to look at restructuring the bill to align it more specifically with the Freelancers and Free Act enforcement which, as you rightly said, is um, a good creative model of how to enforce and implement a law in a way that reduces the amount of time people have to go to court and gets a lot of good compliance based on those initial outreach. So 
uh, thinking about doing that together uh, sounds good. Um, I guess on that front, um, two questions. One, you know, to what extent do we, do we feel like OLPS has the resources that it needs for the demand it currently has? And two, you know, we know one challenge of both of these bills, the Freelancers and Free Act and the, the new one proposed on non-competes is outreach. The people who we're trying to cover, by definition, are not in workplaces where they're going to see a poster put up on the wall. It is hard to reach uh, people who are, by definition, independent and let them know their rights under the law. So could you talk a little about what kinds of outreach you've done for Freelancers and Free Act um, and what you might anticipate doing to let people know about their rights under an expanded version that included this protection against unfair non-compete agreements. Sure, and let me say up front that we agree that the freelance structure really is a, a sort of an elegant solution to the problem here, and we think it's done a lot for a lot of freelancers. And the money that we talked about in our testimony that our, our resources have helped people secure means a lot to those freelancers. Being paid for a job, especially if it's already late, means a lot to their lives, which is something that you mentioned earlier. We want to make sure that that side of the ledger is uh, thought about when we are having these discussions. So on the resource front, we are committed to enforcing the law, implementing the law um, to the best of our ability with the resources at our disposal. As I noted, we have full-time court navigators who are available to freelancers both to handle inquiries and to guide them through the court navigation process and help them understand the rights and protections provided under the law. And we're always in conversations with OMB about those issues. The, uh, on the second piece, uh, outreach is a big part of what we do at DCWP, not just with our labor laws, but with our other laws. And we, we have a dedicated outreach team of, uh, I believe it's up to now eight people, somewhere around there, uh, we can confirm for you. And they do outreach related to all of our laws. With this law specifically, as I'm, I'm sure you remember, we did a big day of action when this law first went into effect. We had people fanning out across the city to distribute educational materials in multiple languages to people who might be freelancers, might know someone who's a freelancer, uh, to help to raise awareness of the law. In addition to those types of direct actions that we've done, we also include freelancer materials at any events that we go to where we think we might reach someone who is either in that community or connected to that community. So when we are going out on business, business education, when we're going out to talk to full-time workers about their rights, we're also try, usually bringing along freelancer materials on the off chance that, that that will reach someone it is useful to. We also do um, extensive public awareness campaigns. You may have seen some of our, uh, our ads on the subway that are helping to reach, um, the, the latest iterations reach workers generally. Um, to let people know about the new DCWP and that we have their back, and we think that that will, um, that will touch some freelancers as well. I think we, if uh, this law were to, go in, it were to be passed, um, we hope that we would get some of the changes we're discussing, and, and I think that we would look at some of those same outreach models that we've already used. So doing direct action, engaging directly with um, CBOs and advocates and employers and hiring parties in this case, uh, and integrating this into our existing outreach structure, which we think is, um, is quite robust uh, at, as, at this stage. We're always looking for ways to improve it. And of course, as we always say at these hearings, if any of you council members would like <laughs> to hold an event with us, please give me a call. We're, we're happy to work with you on that. Just one final question mm -hmm. that goes to the rationale of the bill, and I think as you know, developing our understanding of it. The, the purpose of non-compete agreements, as I understand them, uh, are ordinarily supposed to be so that, you know, the, if it's by a hiring party, they're protected if they are providing to the employee, in most, in most cases, some sort of special knowledge. You know, you get training, you get inside insights, and it might be unfair to, in some cases, like bring the knowledge you have to uh, another uh, competing entity. But that really seems like what is n not at all what is happening with freelancers. I mean, they don't get training. They're not, you know, not that the company is paying for. In most of these cases, you know, they're showing up to, you know, to provide their service. So I don't, I'm not sure I even understand the rationale for them from the hiring party side, other than putting the hiring party in a stronger competitive position, right? They then have a stable of workers that they control um, without any responsibilities to those workers. So 
I just, I'm trying to understand this well and make sure we're thinking about it from all angles, but it really just seems like the way that non-competes are being used in relationship to freelancers doesn't even have the basic rationale that you would want to think about in a competitive marketplace. Like its sole purpose is to increase the bargaining power of one party at the expense of the others. Um, do you see something I'm missing, or does that sound like a... a uh, no, I think your concerns are well-founded. We would defer to hiring parties. I'm sure some of them are here today to speak to this, to, to flesh out their concerns and their reasons. Uh, I think you're correct that under existing New York State law, there are restrictions on the purposes and scope of a non-compete, and there's been some work that has been done about that by the State Attorney General's office. Um, and I think we touched on, on our, in our testimony, we want to make sure that whatever we do here uh, is complementary to those protections rather than interfering with them in some way. So state law already recognizes the concern that you're raising that these non-competes really should serve a purpose like, for example, protecting trade secrets as opposed to unilaterally increasing the bargaining power of, of one party in a transaction. So we agree with you there, but we would defer to hiring parties to flesh that out on their reasoning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Landry. And, and just on that note, as we do at most of these hearings over the last few years where we've introduced these worker protection legislation, we need to talk about workforce and ability to enforce. What does that look like in, in terms of this? Did we look at the numbers on how many folks would be impacted and whether or not we have sufficient workforce and resources to make sure that we have the proper oversight to make sure that this is being enforced? Is that a question, Dr. Yeah, Kennedy, for, that, that. yeah, so we think this would be, uh, we have a lot of agencies up here. I wanna make sure we're answering your question correctly. We, um, as I said, we have dedicated court navigators and our vision for the changes to this bill is to leverage the resources that we already have and the enforcement structure that's already in place um, to ensure that, the, that workers are getting the same services and the same uh, complaint process that they get now for the assistance with these new requirements related to um, non-compete clauses. So, so yes, I'm confident that we can implement the law with the resources at our disposal. That, that's what we're always setting out to do. Uh, we will continue to have dedicated court navigators. They, if this law become, goes into effect, they'll be trained on it. Uh, they'll be able to assist freelancers and ready to do so. Thank you, thank you very much. Sure. Um, and, and on, I'm sorry, I'm jump back to 1604. Um, could you explain the, the and as we review claims from 2016, 17, and 18, that there was uh, between uh, 16 and 17, there was a 17% increase, and then last year we saw a 2.5% decrease. Could you explain uh, where that came from, what those numbers look like? I wish I could. Uh, honestly, we are, we are not in the business of necessarily explaining this, we are in the business of processing these claims. So I, as to why there would be an increase. Not why, where did they come from? Oh, you mean which agencies? Not, not necessarily even where, yeah, yeah, agencies. You can say which agencies increase. Um, I, I think the agencies that increased dramatically were DOC and DOT. Um, the reasons for that are not entirely clear but that would seem to be a big driver of this increase. Is it claims, services, medical bills? What, what is it? Um, I think it's the cl just generally not the number of claim the, the claims themselves. Are you sure? I, I am sure, but maybe I'm not understanding how much the are we question. Spending on, what, what, how much are we spending on, 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 on uh, medical bills, practitioners, and services? Medical bills, um, I believe we're paying, we paid the last report indicated 50, 58.5 million in medical bills, medical services. And that was for 18? Yeah. And claims? 338 million. Okay, and um, again, of course, city. It, in, as you gather this this data, um, is there is there something that is that information that you have that has been reported that is not necessarily required to be reported and not necessarily in the report that we're, that we're not seeing here? I don't think so. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, we're gonna, um, so we've been joined by Council Member Kalos. Yes, and uh, I think we had some questions. We were also joined by Council Member Ulrich. Um, we, we will now hear from Council Member Ben Kalos. I want to start by thanking our uh, civil service and labor chair, I, Danique Miller, who comes from labor uh, as a president of a local union and has been fighting for our working families his entire career and has continued to do so in the city council. Uh, I am a proud sponsor of Introduction 1321. I am proud to be uh, wearing a certain color, and I'm not sure if I'll get away with this, but if I, I'll try. 32. Thank you. I won't do that again. Uh, but I just want to thank all of the 32 BJ members for being here today. Uh, I see some familiar faces on the panel. At one point, I was the chair of the Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions Committee, where the city uh, was building affordable housing on city property or formerly city property. And uh, does anyone recall on occasion me asking about wage rates and benefits for our city employees at hearings twice a month, every month for 18 months? Of course. Uh, so I'm going to follow along these lines. I think that, in my opinion, 1321 takes us in the right direction. And I'll just say, representing the east side, it's our building service workers that make the east side what it is. Uh, and constituents in my district love their building service workers. Oftentimes, they're a part of the family. Uh, they're often, uh, if there's Thanksgiving, there's often so much food downstairs brought down by family members, it's not even funny. Uh, and I, I will say that in my district, we want to pay our building service workers more. And uh, in fact, every single holiday season, we do so. So along those lines, I want to talk a little bit about affordable housing. And so the first issue is by creating poverty wage jobs, uh, so I'm concerned that by creating poverty wage jobs that Housing New York is contradicting its own mandate to address our affordable housing crisis. Bad jobs are what create the need for affordable housing in the first place. Uh, do you think it's inconsistent to build affordable housing in order to address priority while creating low wage building service jobs that leave workers unable to afford some of the affordable housing we're even building because at minimum wage the job, the, the affordable housing would have to be 30% of AMI, but the bulk and majority is 60% and above. Uh, so appreciate the question. We actually had a similar back and forth with Council Member Lander earlier in this hearing. Um, so I, you know, I think what we shared is, uh, you know, we underwrite to a $56,000 salary for supers, a $44,000 salary for porters. Um, I think that you know is about it. 70 and 60 percent of AMI, respectively. You know, I think the housing plan certainly seeks to build uh, housing for a variety of New Yorkers, which we think that fits in there. Um, and you know, again, certainly uh, share the goal of ensuring that this administration is creating uh, high-quality jobs while also uh, creating as many affordable housing units as possible. Uh, you know, and certainly here to speak to trying to strike that right balance. So in terms of the $44,165 a year that you underwrite for, is that inclusive or exclusive of health insurance, disability insurance, and a retirement? So is that 44000 and then they get benefits on top of that you're underwriting towards, or just 44000 all in? Uh, that, that is what you know we underwrite to. I can't speak to uh, benefits or wages at this moment. Again, you know, happy to have further conversations, uh, but yeah. I think the concern is if the person has no benefits, uh, then they're going to be paying a, a fee to the IRS for not having health insurance. And if they do need health insurance, that's health insurance is expensive. <laughs> Health insurance is really, really expensive. It's like a thousand dollars, and with what the Republicans have done to roll it back. So, so if you're taking home forty-four thousand, but then you're immediately paying at least a thousand dollars a month out of pocket, that takes you down to thirty-two thousand dollars a year before taxes. Like, sorry, with ta depending on how you purchase it, but like that—that's even 
and then with the housing costs, and, and it's just, is, is $44,000 a year really enough to live on for anybody? You know, I, again, I think that we, you know, use the housing plan to try and create affordable housing at a range of incomes. Um, you know, I can't speak specifically on a project-by-project -project basis what developers are doing uh, relative to uh, health insurance or benefits or anything like that. An another piece of this is trying to have, I, th I think my dream, and as you know, I, all of the hearings I always asked uh, about local hire provisions and if somebody watching on TV heard about something in their neighborhood, uh, what have you. So I guess one of the things is just that we need good jobs in low-income communities where affordable housing is often built and where the workers often live. Can you share what the median income of these communities where city finance affordable housing is being built and how much the affordable housing being built in low-income neighborhoods uh, is available to residents in the local neighborhood and wouldn't ensuring that local residents have access to good jobs in these projects be a key way to ensure that the affordable housing does not, uh, that it can benefit people in the communities where it's located? Yeah, so I don't have, um, you know, a neighborhood by neighborhood breakdown in front of me. Obviously happy to have further conversations with you about that. Um, but as I, you know, mentioned in testimony of the 123,000 units that we've financed to date, 40% of those are available to New Yorkers with the lowest incomes. Now, the city is already underwriting prevailing wage and affordable housing projects in rezoning areas with MIHCQA, demonstrating that it, that you can do prevailing wage as part of uh, affordable housing in, in some of the lowest income housing. What's the difference, Manish Tana? Like, why can't we do it across the board? Why is it only limited to the rezonings? Yeah, so we, um, you know, actually think about 10,000 of the units we do this year, uh, we estimate, are either underwritten to prevailing wage or uh, are in buildings on preservation deals where there might be an existing labor contract, which obviously we respect when we are moving forward. I think uh, the concern relative to the rezoning areas is really, oh, sorry, I just got a correction. I think I said 10,000, I meant 15,000. Um, mixed up my numbers in my head there. Uh, but, I, you know, back to the rezoning question, I think it's just a question of scaling up. I think it is going, you know, is going to require us putting more subsidy in up front on those projects. We have done that in rezoning areas and I think are certainly willing to have conversations with the council and have had ongoing conversations with uh, our partners in labor, but want to make sure we get the balance right since, you know, some projects are just going to require a little bit more flexibility than others. And just to dig all the way into the numbers, which you know I like to do, when we do, when you do affordable housing projects, these projects can be like tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars. Is that fair? Is that the the scope of a lot of these projects? These are very large projects. Yes, many of them. And when you're talking about a building service worker, if it's rehabilitation, maybe it's a super for a cluster of buildings, uh, a porter. Like you're talking sometimes as. I guess it's three people you might have on a cluster or even on a building. Is that the, the minimum you would say? Or? Uh, our financing assumes that there will be uh, one worker for uh, up to 65 units and it sort of scales from there. And like 65 units is like a, a big project and that's again tens of millions of dollars. That's probably 65 units might be a $30 million project. And so we're talking about as far as I understand the difference between paying some about $38,000 a year in difference. Is that? I, I don't understand where you're, well, I don't understand what that is. So I'm, I'm just drilling down to, we're talking about paying somebody $44,165 a year or paying somebody more of a living wage where they will make roughly $38,000 more a year. Sure. So I guess on a $30 million project, what is what would the cost differential be uh, uh, to to have that one person per 65 units make a a prevailing wage a, a wage that they can live on in New York City? Yeah, so you know, as uh, I've said before, it's about $9,300 per unit. Obviously, the total cost on that is going to depend on how large the building is. I just do want to flag for you, which I flagged for some of your colleagues. Um, you know, one of our concerns certainly here is our preservation deals, 
where you know it's one thing if you're talking about a new construction project, but on preservation deals, particularly for those mid-sized buildings in the like 100 to 150 unit range, mm -hmm. um, it's up to that property owner whether they are coming to the city to work with us. And we certainly see plenty of property owners um, that you know come to us and might you know those units aren't otherwise regulated they aren't in a regulatory agreement they aren't already rent stabilized um, and the more requirements we put on them particularly if those are buildings where we are maybe just giving a tax exemption or the cost per unit is much lower it is harder for us to actually make up that subsidy and we you know think that those owners might not actually want to work with us uh, do you, does anyone on the panel have an estimate on this number? Because I think we're literally talking about at this point $38,000 per worker per 65 units on like multi-million dollar projects. So it seems awfully small to be fighting about. Uh, to be clear, I'm the only person from HPD on the panel right now. Uh, okay. <laughs> fit, 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 okay. Uh, I would like, will, will you provide whatever supporting documentations you can come to with the $9,300 per unit differential per unit? Uh, sure, I can follow up with that. And, you know, just do want to certainly reiterate to you and to the rest of the committee, you know, I think HPD is certainly ready and willing to continue having these conversations to figure out the right way to strike the balance here. And at 9300 a unit, what is the total cost per unit in subsidies for HPD? Uh, I think, you know, I don't have that number in front of me. I think it's going to depend a little bit on some of the language in the bill. I think with the supportive housing carve out and, uh, you know, exactly what projects are getting included, I don't have a, you know, annual uh, estimate in front of me. I want to clarify my question. You have an estimate per unit of how much it would cost to pay people a prevailing wage. Do you have an estimate of how much subsidy on average HPD gives to build each new unit of affordable housing? Yeah, so I think I had given a number before that I think might have been actually a little bit higher. Um, you know, as you very well know, it uh, depends term sheet to term sheet. Um, you know, some of our, you know, more deeply affordable uh, term sheets and certainly the ones that include supportive housing or our senior buildings require a lot more subsidy in order for us to make those projects work, whereas you have, you know, things like the green preservation loan program where we might be providing closer to $20,000 per unit. Um, so it, it really depends on the project structure. Uh, new affordable housing, straight affordable housing, 60% to AMI, not for seniors, not for supportive, not for any of Green Deal, just straight up the mayor's housing plan to build 180,000 of new units, new construction. Yeah, so I had given uh, a number of that I thought the average was 150,000 before. I'm worried that that is incorrect and it's actually a little bit higher, um, so I'd like to follow up. I, I, would I would estimate it's probably closer to a quarter million dollars per unit or higher once you're all in with all the additional subsidies, but uh, when you can, so we're not even talking about when you say it's 9,100 out of 150,000, you're not even talking about 10%. Uh, it's closer to seven and a half percent. And so when folks say, oh, labor costs, if we do a prevailing wage and pay people and give them benefits and give them training so no one dies on these construction sites, oh, it's going to cost 20 to 30 percent more. We're in the single digits. And I want to be clear that, you know, what I'm here talking about today and what that number is, is about building service workers, not about construction workers. Agreed. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank our chair. And I want to thank all of my brothers and sisters at 32BJ for being here today. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos, for your insight and expertise, as usual. We're going to call the next panel. We thank the panel for, for being here. And we have... Uh, additional questions that we will be forwarding over to uh, the individual agencies. Thank you. So, um, the next panel is Shirley Aldebar, Justin Sinclair, Kyle Bragg, Saul Hernandez. Marilyn Vasquez. And Elizabeth Salonovic. Salonovic. Okay. Please speak clearly, be concise, and uh, we have 
ton of people to, to testify today, so we're going to be on a hard clock. while we start down this in here. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I will, uh, in the interest of time and the many speakers who would like to testify today, try to attempt to be both concise and brief. My name is Kyle Bragg, and I'm Executive Vice President, Secretary Treasurer of SEIU Local 32BJ. My union represents 165,000 workers, including department workers, janitors, security officers, and airport workers. Of those members, 80,000 of them live right here in New York City. In fact, approximately one out of every 100 adult residents of New York City is a 32BJ member. Of our 35,000 apartment workers, 3,000 of them are proud, affordable housing workers with good jobs. In fact, we represent the majority of non-NYCHA affordable housing workers in this city. They take care of working class families by day and earn enough to come home and take care of their own families at night. Today I want to touch on three points relating to the jobs, housing, and why we are urging the City Council to pass this bill. First, we are facing an affordable housing crisis, but the crisis is fundamentally connected to a crisis of low wage service work in our city. We cannot address the affordable housing crisis while growing the pool of jobs that place families in poverty and leave them without access to good health care and a secure retirement. Using public dollars to create housing for some while resigning others to live in insecurity and struggle just doesn't make sense. Intro 1321 is a common sense piece of legislation that will create good jobs while also supporting New York City and continuing to pursue ambitious affordable housing goals and serving the most vulnerable populations. Second, failing to create prevailing wage jobs in city finance affordable housing has serious consequences for working families citywide. 30, 32BJ members have fought for many years to create strong wage and benefit standards in the residential building service sector, including income restricted housing. But by allowing developers who benefit from taxpayer money to pay poverty wages in new affordable housing developments, the city is undermining this high road. Continued inaction on this issue could drive the industry to a tipping point, where good jobs become the exception, not the rule. When this has happened in other industries, employees have rushed to do whatever they could to break union contracts, outsource to low road contractors, and force families into poverty. Our 3,000 members with good jobs and affordable housing, and in fact, all of our members in the residential industry are counting on you to make sure that this is not the destiny that awaits their families. Many of our members are here and excited to share stories with you about what the prevailing wage actually means to them. Third, I want to emphasize how much more we need to do to support the low-income communities where most affordable housing is built. The nature of the affordable housing is built on the cheapest land available where public dollars go the furthest. It's also the nature of the affordable housing that not all of the units can be made available to the local community members, as a lottery system has to provide opportunity to New York's from other parts of the city. At times, neighborhood residents are unable to qualify for available units because their income levels are too low. For these reasons, it behooves us to support these communities with the permanent good jobs and affordable housing. New affordable housing being built in low-income neighborhoods should be a source of strength for those communities, not a source of poverty jobs. With this bill, you have a chance to truly make progress on our affordable housing crisis, protect and expand the good standards that have been given tens of thousands of workers in New York 
a chance to make it in our city and invest, and invest in good jobs in low-wage communities. So I urge the City Council to pass this, and I want to thank you for your time today. Good morning, Chair Miller and committee members. My name is Shirley Aldewal, and I'm Vice President of SCIU Local 32BJ. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of the union's 85,000 members in New York City. New York City's affordable housing crisis has its origins in two concurrent trends. One, the stagnation or decline of wages for low-income workers and the inaccessibility of affordable housing. New York City's affordable housing programs are currently addressing only one, the latter issue. This bill, however, provides an opportunity to address both causes of the affordable housing crisis. New York's affordable housing programs can and should provide affordable housing and good jobs that allow workers to afford housing and provide for their families. We know that New York City can do this because it already does. The city already requires prevailing wages at city-subsidized affordable housing in over 30 units, area-wide rezoning neighborhoods. But we have to go further to ensure that all workers in affordable housing are protected going forward. Low-wage work is one of the prime causes of affordable housing, of the affordable housing crisis. From December 2009 to June 2017, rents in New York City increased 3.9%, but incomes only increased by 1.8%. That is rent, that is that rent increases at more than twice the rate that incomes have increased. Further, the relatively smaller income increase has not been uniformly distributed. From 2009 to 2015, the biggest wage gains have gone to higher paid workers. And from 2009 to 2016, the biggest growth in jobs has been in the low wage sector. The city should continue to fight against this trend of paltry wage gains and bad jobs as and bad jobs as it has done through the existing prevailing wage law, the living wage law, the app driver compensation standards, and take additional steps to ensure that its subsidies are not used to create low-wage jobs in the affordable housing sector, especially as any low-wage building service job also impacts higher paying jobs by putting downward pressure on wages. This bill provides an opportunity for affordable housing programs to address both causes of the affordable housing crisis and does so through a method that has already been proven to work. On behalf of the thousands of apartment workers, I urge you to support this bill. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Justin Sinclair. I've been working for 32BJ for three years. I'm a property service worker. Prior to getting the job working as a property service worker, getting the prevailing wage, I worked in catering. When the work was sporadic, I could get to take whatever shifts I could. And I've been missing out on many family gatherings and holiday events and just trying to make ends meet. When I finally got the prevailing job, my life changed. For the first time in 10 years, I was actually able to go to the doctor. I hadn't gone to the doctor in forever. Um, I was actually able to get glasses for my son when I went to the doctor. Before I couldn't get, I was nervous to go in there. I was embarrassed that he wanted an expensive pair and I couldn't afford those. So and now I can finally afford them. But now finally, I'm able to shift my focus from just trying to cover my day-to-day -day expenses and trying to focus on entrepreneurship and creating wealth for my family and for other people in my community. Uh, the people in the work in affordable housing are doing the same job that I am, and they deserve to make this industry standard. When people are paid livable wages, you can take care of yourself and give back and do right by your community. This is not just about individuals. This is about working people as a whole. You have an opportuni opportunity today to change the lives of working families, and in turn, working class communities will thrive. I urge you to vote yes. Good afternoon, Trey Miller and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and thank you, Speaker Corny Johnson, for prioritizing the needs of workers. My name is Elisabetta Salinovic and I have been a, a member of 32 BJs for two years. I am a commercial cleaner and I live in Astoria. When I first came to this country and before I got my current job, my family struggled. I spent all my money on rent, and I had no money left for food. I was hard to tell my son, 
we couldn't afford to eat together or buy him a new sneakers. I had to worry about how I was go going to put food on the table and figure out how we were going to survive. My life is easier now and make the privilege rich. I can afford to support my family, address my health problems, and get the surgery I needed. It. Without my health care, I will not be alive right now. I have friends who make the minimum wage and live paycheck to paycheck. They have kids and often help them pay for food because they cannot afford it. Workers should not be put in this position. I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, and thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson, and bringing attention to the needs of workers. My name is Saul Hernandez. I have been a member for 11 years. Um, I work as a uh, handy person uh, in Soho, and I live in Richmond Hill. Before I'm making prevailing wages, I couldn't live independently. I had to live with relatives to order to make rent. Uh, make rent. With, uh, with a prevailing um, wage job, it means I can eat. It means I can pay rent because of my health benefits. Um, I don't have to pay out of pocket. My kids can go to a doctor and a dentist. I could afford better quality clothes and I can save a little bit of money. Uh, building services, workers, and affordable housing develop, developments should uh, make the prevailing wages so they can make their rent, pay their bills, and live in New York City with dignity. I hope the city council passed this bill. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Members Moya, who is chairing uh, his hearing next door, and I know he's in. Did you have any questions? No. I'm, I'm okay. So I just, and I'm sure he'll be back. We've also been joined by Council Member Rosenthal, and, uh, I, and I know she has a question, so I'm going to put you right to work and kick it over to Council Member. I appreciate you. Just came from another meeting. Um, Thank you so much, Chair, for holding this hearing. Thank you for being here today and testifying. I think um, it's important that we say out loud that while the fight for 15 was so important and so great to win, it can't become the new normal. And it's certainly not a living wage. Um, we need prevailing wages for all workers, full stop. And so I'm very excited about this bill. And, I, um, and I would, I'm glad to be a co-sponsor of it. Um, but I want to share with you my concerns. And, and I share them because I, I need help in figuring out what to do. Um, one of the in sets of organizations that will be in the wonderful position of paying a prevailing wage are our nonprofit CBOs, you know, our senior centers, daycare centers that are freestanding and who I know want to pay all of their workers prevailing wage. In fact, if you look at the statistics about their workers, 65% uh, are eligible for welfare. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we would start to address this. My concern is with the payers for senior services and for after-school programs and daycare centers, that the payers of those organizations will not pay for prevailing wage. In other words, um, my local senior center, community center, um, gets, uh, is funded primarily by government. 
They have city funds, they have state funds, and they have private donations. And the city and the state are pretty mingy payers. And it's one of the things that I've been working on is to get them to be better payers. And we have had some successes over the last few years. This administration put in money for COLAs and for some overhead costs. And all workers got COLAs, which is good. How do we get government to pay for workers to have a prevailing wage is my concern. Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Councilman uh, Rosenthal. Um, that's not particularly uh, in my wheel well uh, as to those industries. But what I can say is that what we believe and what I believe strongly is that the, no government dollars should be subsidizing poverty jobs. And so I wish I could had the answer for you as to why uh, this is happening, why uh, government allows it to happen. But speaking to our industry, I think you've heard from the benefits of our members who are receiving prevailing wages. Those members are able to take care of their families, not depend on city uh, services, uh, and, and are also uh, adding to the vitality of their communities that they live in by being economic engines in those communities. They take those dollars, they reinvest them into the communities and into the city. They pay taxes, they, they buy clothing, they use other services. And so this money is being regenerated into, into the life and blood of this city. And so I, all, all I can say is I agree with you, but, I can, but I, we, we, we also agree that uh, public dollars should not uh, be used to uh, uh, supplement or, or create poverty wage jobs. We are preaching to each other. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Let me ask it a different way. Would you help stand with me to make sure that government picks up the cost so that no uh, worker is um, living in poverty and making sure that government picks up their share? What I can say to you uh, in the affirmative is that 32BJ has always been about raising people out of poverty, and we stand with any partners whose objective is to create uh, good wage jobs that allow people to work in both dignity and respect, uh, and also to be able to uh, be part of the economic engine of our city and our state. So yes, uh, wherever there are people working in poverty, uh, we stand with those people who are trying to lift them out of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks you to all of you for being here. Um, I want to ask a question or two that follows on my questions to HPD because I realized uh, some things after their questioning that I hadn't really backed out. So, you know, they said to me that in a prevailing wage uh, situation, they budget uh, overall 91,000 for a super, 86,000 for a porter, and in a non-prevailing uh, um, situation, 56 and 44. And I think it left the impression uh, that that's the salary that people are being paid. But of course, that's just the total amount they're putting in the budget for all in. So that 44,000 for a, a porter in a non-prevailing wage project includes a whole lot of things that are not that porter's salary, right? So payroll, ta help me just get this right, is payroll taxes, health benefits, like what else is uh, we gotta drop down to before we figure out what that person's actually taking home? And this is a non-prevailing wage. They probably don't even have any retirement security at all. But. Well, thank you again, uh, Councilman. I think uh, Councilman Carlos has also had addressed that issue um, about uh, the, uh, the underwriting for um, these uh, uh, developments. And that $44,000 uh, obviously um, is not going all to wages. You have to provide health care by law. And uh, we know how expensive health care is. Um, that's just the tip of the sword, right? And so um, there are many costs uh, that are associated with uh, um, working, period. You take in consideration that uh, 
workers have to travel to and from work. They have to provide for their families. They have to uh, pay their <laughs> their own rents. Uh, and so, if I I I can't I can't. Uh, uh, take you through what that 44,000 represents. I certainly can take you through what the 78.5 uh, represents for our members. The 78.5, uh, which is approximately the prevailing wage for an entry level porter in our industry, uh, provides a, 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 a livable wage uh, of 24, uh, a little more than $24 an hour. It gives them uh, access to training, which allows them to advance in the industry and the career that they have chosen. It gives them uh, quality and affordable and access, access to quality and affordable health care, and it gives them retirement security as well. And so, if you take into consideration the delta between the 44 and the 78, um, what, what, what really are we fighting over? Well, why would we keep people in poverty and allow them to have to rely on city services to supplement them? They're, they're, they're working every day, getting up to, to go to a job, doing the job that's, that other members, 80, 90 percent of the workers in the city are being paid a living wage at, uh, but yet they have to themselves then work every day, but also then depend on city services in order to survive. And so I, can, I, I can't break down the 44,000, but I certainly can tell you where that 78.5 goes and how it goes to both uh, allow people to work in dignity and respect, but also revitalize our own city. That money gets regenerated back into this city. It gets regenerated back into the state. They pay taxes. They, they buy services. They, their kids are in schools. Uh, it, it's, it, the value is, is really being marginalized as we look at these numbers. Okay, I appreciate that, and actually, obviously, hearing the, the value of the additional amounts and what it buys for stability for families is, is very helpful. I think it'd be good to work together afterwards and really figure out what it really is down from 44, because understanding what folks are currently being paid, um, it would be really helpful in knowing, you know, who we're talking about and, you know, if that is more like in the low 30s once you take out health care cost and payroll taxes and I don't know what all else, um, it would provide a different, it'd be well below the 60% of AMI that HPD uh, responded here. So I'd like to understand that a little better. And uh, just my last point to note, um, uh, building off or responding to Councilmember Rosenthal's questions, you know, we want everybody to be earning a, a decent wage. One unique situation here is that we're not, in this case, even though these are publicly subsidized um, buildings, we don't have to, you know, if we get the capital subsidy right so that the budget is built in a way that provides for workers to be paid the prevailing wage, we don't have to come back every couple of years when the contract is renegotiated or that is a critical issue and needs to be focused on, but, but if we underwrite these projects thoughtfully for their cost, then over the length of the project, the next 30 years, we can make sure that all the workers who are in there uh, would have the benefit of this. That'll have that additional upfront cost, and we can't just hand wave at it. You know, if, if it costs a, you know, a bit extra, you know, 9,300 or whatever the precise number is, you know, we either have to come up with that extra 7, 8, 9 percent, or we'd wind up with a little less affordable housing. So that's on us to make sure we're paying real attention to, but the benefit then lasts the length of the project. Thank you, and I agree. And we have some technical experts who will be testifying here today from our research department who will be addressing those uh, exact issues that you have raised and um, uh, Councilman Kalos also have raised and other thank council you. people. So thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. We'll call our next panel. Joel Schufer. Joel Schufer. Michael Gruber. Hakeem Watkins. Gary Smiley, Chester Luca Zasquiski, and Orin Barzalay. Okay, please, uh, we're going to be on the hard clock. Remind everyone to state your name for the record 
as you begin the testimony. And you could, add, if we could start at one end or the other, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller and members of the council for allowing me to speak today. My name is Michael Gruber. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Pasternak, Tilker, Ziegler, Walsh, Stanton, and Romano. And I represent uh, injured workers before the Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, and despite making my living representing injured workers, I am always happy to testify in support of any legislation that promotes or encourages workplace safety. And I believe that the amendments to Subdivision C of Section 12127 offered by Chairman Miller uh, do exactly that. Although the city has been required to report on workplace injuries for a number of years, the information provided in those reports is not comprehensive enough to allow us to reach and address the root causes of injuries at work. The current report is unusable in the fact that it does not allow us to determine what specific job duties cause or contribute to workplace injuries. The language added to the bill by the offered amendments will allow us to better, better analyze workplace injuries. This new legislation requires the city to report on workplace injuries not only by agency but also by job title. This is of critical importance because this new data will allow us to better identify patterns of injuries. We can identify why a worker in a certain job title uh, has a higher incidence of uh, being injured than a worker who may be in a different job title but in the same agency. That differentiation is not currently made by the report promulgated by the City of New York. Uh, once these patterns are identified, more effective and targeted uh, interventional programs can be developed to try and reduce the risk factors for workplace injuries. Uh, for significance for my clients, the new bill also requires the city to report on what efforts each of its agencies has made to offer modified duty assignments to those who have suffered workplace injuries. Uh, this helps my clients who are uh, injured and are not able to go back to their jobs at full capacity but wish to go back to work in a modified duty position. It allows the report to um, uh, address that issue and see what steps the agencies, each agency is taking uh, to offer modified duty programs to injured workers. Uh, all of these changes to the law are geared towards the goal of not just knowing how many injures or workers are injured at work, but also how they are injured at work, what causes the injured, injuries at work, and what we can do to try to avoid these injur injuries in the future. The result of all these changes will be decreased workers' compensation costs to the city of New York and, more, and a safer workplace for city workers. Thank you. Um, my name is Joel Shufro. I am the uh, former director of the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, NICOSH. However, I want to em emphasize that I'm speaking here as an individual and not as a rep representing NICOSH or any other organization. I want to th thank Council Member Miller for holding these hearings and introducing the amendments. And I want to thank my council member uh, for attending, Brad Lander, uh, who's uh, represents us well. Um, I'm here to support the amend amendments in uh, intro 1604. Uh, it was the intent of the sponsors of Local Law 41 of uh, 2004 to provide the city, its agencies, the unions representing New York City employees, nonprofit advocacy organizations like NICOSH, and workers themselves with data about the scope and nature of workplace in injuries and illnesses suffered by New York City workers. The intent of those who introduced the law was to provide the agencies and unions uh, to use limited, their limited resources to develop targeted intervention programs in an, uh, in an effective manner. The amendment does nothing more than to attempt to achieve what those who introduced the legislation some 15 years ago thought the law uh, was intended to do. Why is the amendment needed? Unfortunately, the law was written in a manner uh, that the report issued by the uh, the New York City Department of Law Workers' Compensation Division is relatively useful in identifying patterns of injuries and illnesses within city agencies. While the data needed to construct 
such a report and outlined in the first section of the law is collected and transmitted to the mayor's office, much of the data is not included in the report issued by the Department of Law. According to the, to the most recent report issued by the department, uh, 18,131 workers' compensation claims were uh, for job-related injuries and illnesses uh, to New York City employees uh, were established in 2018. And this costs the city approximately $25 million. Uh, these costs are added to the $345 million that the city already pays for ongoing claims to uh, workers who were con contracted work uh, place in illnesses or were injured on the job in previous years. When placed in the context of New York City's budget, of which is $70 billion, this appears small, but what we're talking about are recurring costs, and the $345 million that the city spends every year multiplied by, let's say, 10 years, is $3.5 billion, not a small amount of money. These are direct costs. They're not indirect costs, which are estimated to be approximately by Liberty Mutual about five times the uh, direct costs. Without good data, we cannot have programs to intervene in the workplace to establish programs to reduce these injuries and illnesses. Passing these amendments is a win-win uh, for the city. The workers win because they're have programs that reduce human suffering, city wins in lower costs. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing to speak here today. Uh, my name is Oren Barzilay, president of FDNY EMS Local 2507. I do not have a testimony. I just came here to let you be aware that while we support uh, resolution 0040, there is one small language issue that excludes our members. The language has in it the wording of accidental disability. That would exclude our members. It needs to be changed to performance of duty. Uh, prior to meeting here, to, to arriving here today, we spoke with the staff of Carnegie and Koslowitz, and they will. Uh, with the council members, they will review this uh, wording. I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the council. Thank you. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chair Miller and colleagues. <clears throat> thank you for the time here. Thank you for my, he my time here today, and thank you for taking up um, Resolution 0040, which is an extremely important resolution that would resolve an ongoing nightmare for some NICERS members, um, especially members of the New York City Fire Department's Emergency and Medical Service Command. My name is Gary Smiley, and I served the city of New York for 27 years as a paramedic, HASTAC paramedic, rescue paramedic, as well as a medical specialist on New York Task Force One, which is the Urban Search and Rescue Task Force. I currently serve as the World Trade Center liaison for the uniformed paramedics, inspectors, and EMTs of the New York City Fire Department. I was critically injured in the collapse of the North Tower on September 11th after my unit responded within five minutes of the first plane striking the North Tower. I was in the hospital for a week, suffering from crush syndrome, difficulty breathing, kidney failure, rhabdomyolysis, and other injuries. I fought my way back to work and the job that I've loved since I was 19 years old and continued with my career even though I began to get sick very quickly after September 11th. I retired in 2012 and moved out of New York City in hopes of continuing my career, but soon realized that after only three months, I was extremely sick and getting sicker. I'm currently certified with the following World Trade Center illnesses. Sinusitis, rhinosinusitis, GERD, asthma, reactive airway disease, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and yet to be certified illnesses by NIOSH, including rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, and syndrome X diabetes. I got sick in early 2002 with World Trade Center cough, severe sinus and respiratory disease, and was followed early on at Mount Sinai's medical monitoring clinic. Uh, my current treating doctor is Dr. Crane, who is the director of the World Trade Center medical monitoring at Mount Sinai. 
I had major sinus surgery in 2005, 2006, and since has had 17 sinus procedures. Developed a, le a lesion in my left ear due to chronic sinus infections, which has taken away most of my balance and equilibrium. I'm also followed at Sloan Kettering for cysts in my left kidney and spleen. Why this legislation and resolution are so important. After I retired, I tried to move, so I took $50,000 out of my pension and bought a home in North Carolina. Got a job as a paramedic, but within three months got very sick and had to have additional surgeries, which required me to move back to New York City. My house went into foreclosure. At the urging of my doctors and my family, I moved back to New York, but bounced around from rental to rental because I could not afford to live as I normally used to. And the reasons behind that are as follows. My NICERS timeline. In, on September 23rd of 2013, I applied for a reclassification for a World Trade Center disability pension. In February of 2014, I was denied by NICERS. In March of 2014, I was sent for a psychiatric evaluation by NICERS. In March 2014, my appeal was denied. In December of 2014, the medical board again denied me. On April 7th of 2015, I was approved by the New York State Workers' Compensation Board for disability related to all of my 9-11 illnesses listed above. September of 2015, NICERS sent me for a second psychiatric evaluation. On November 19th of 2015, I was approved by the Social Security Administration as permanently disabled due to my 9-11 illnesses. In December of 2015, once again, the NICERS Medical Board denied my, my application for World Trade Center disability. In March of 2015, NICERS gave a final denial. During these gaps, the medical boards, my attorney, during these gaps in medical boards, my attorneys and I were supplying additional and updated medical documentation to NICERS. Approximately May of 2016, I was forced to file an Article 78 proceeding in the State Supreme Court, which cost me $10,000. January 6th of 2017, the State Supreme Court returned my Article 78 proceeding, remanding me back to the medical board as the judge threw out NICERS' decision. Because that could only be a recommendation, in March of 2017, NICER sent me for a second psychiatric evaluation, ignoring all my medical ailments. On November 9th of 2017, NICERS approved me for a three-quarters disability pension for post-traumatic stress disorder, ignoring every medical illness that has kept me from continuing my career as a paramedic. With regards to Resolution 0040, as my president stated, it must read two very important things, performance of duty and or, and or World Trade Center pension, and it also must read Social Security and or New York State Workman's Comp Disability Decision. 98% of my members don't have a Social Security decision because they're still working, but probably 20 to 30 to 40 percent of World Trade Center and non-World Trade Center members do have workman's comp decisions labeling them as disabled. I want to add. You got to wrap up. <laughs> you got to wrap up. We have to just you know, wrap up and we want to do some questioning, okay? If I can just add that this and other egregious actions by the NYSERS Medical Board and its chairman, Dr. Botner, are a direct result an attack against the FDNY World Trade Center hero paramedics and emergency medical technicians that responded that day. It is also my belief and the belief of many 9-11 advocates that NICER's behavior in giving World Trade Center members a disability pension with a diagnosis of PTSD, including PTSD as a part diagnosis, or leaving out a World Trade Center cancer diagnosis, as has happened in the past, is a direct attempt to deny our members the ability to receive a full Victims' Compensation Fund award or severely limit the member from receiving a full award as PTSD is non-compensable and leaving out a cancer diagnosis also severely limits a member's VCF award. Thank you so much for my time. Good afternoon, Council Member Miller and members of the Council. My name is Hakeem Watkins. I am a former FDNY EMS employee. I was injured in 2013. I came onto the job in 2012. Um, I have also been through a 
lot of things with NICERS. Um, I went, I filed my application, NICERS um, called the police on me um, because I have psychiatric issues relating from my injury. I went to probably, I would say, over four psych IMEs. And the only reason why NICES is denying me is because I'm not having spinal surgery. NICES, every single one of the IMEs that NICES has sent me to, they have said I was disabled. The first doctor that they sent me to said I was disabled. They sent me to another doctor to make him change his mind. I went through a remand with the Supreme Court at the following in um, Article 78 proceeding. Um, I received the workers' compensation, disability. I was medically separated from the fire department. I received social security um, decision of disability. And the only reason why the judges cannot basically say that a person goes out is less as a matter of law is because NYSIS has the final say so. And this resolution urging you to push this resolution, the nicest resolution, would put a checks and balances so that once a person either gets Social Security or workers' compensation, that nicest would have to be bound by them by law to do the right thing. Because we have 9-11 victims. We have people who have hurt their back. We have people who have multiple injuries. But nicest is just keeps taking people through the ringer because they can. And I personally don't understand how a city agency could overrule Social Security and workers' compensation and fire department doctors and specialists and send you back and forth and even ignore the doctors that they send you to and not even really allow your representation to give that doctor any evidence because they, they give the doctor their own supportive evidence. They shop around for doctors to give them their decision. But every single doctor in my particular situation has said that I am disabled. They sent me to a final psych IME, and that doctor said I was disabled. And NYSIS is still saying that I'm not disabled at this point in time. And we're still in litigation, but we went through a remand and they are at, NYSIS has the position where they're not going to look over my medical evidence. They decided that they are not going to see me. They're saying that I can go back and work, but they themselves are scared to be in a room with me alone because of psychiatric issues. So I don't understand how you can say that you're scared of, to be in a room with an EMT or an EMS member and then say that these people can go back into the street and work. That absolutely makes absolutely no sense. Okay, agreed. Um, Mr. Schufer, um, the administration testified that having, that having occupational disease separately classified um, as a claim would not be useful, would, would not be useful um, to do so, and that is currently all claims are reported to the agency, um, whether it's an accident or occupational disease. It is, it is not captured in the report as such. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, occupational disease is undercompensated in our system. Uh, so a lot of government statistics show that approximately only about 5 to 10 percent of workers with occupational disease end up uh, getting compensated. Uh, it is very important that the uh, report make an attempt to uh, delineate and designate uh, those people, those cases that are occupational disease cases. They are, they are the most expensive cases. Uh, and result in higher medical costs and wage replacement cases. And so, therefore, trying to figure out how they arise uh, will be are really a very important. I believe also, and I can be corrected by my friend here from uh, the workers' compensation firm, that going through the system, there are two categories, accidents and occupational diseases. And they, are, they have different legal terminologies and, uh, and so they class, the 
it would not be hard for the agency to distinguish between those which are accidents and occupational diseases. And I do agree with Mr. Shufro in that respect. Uh, although I have great respect for Ms. Roller who testified here earlier, uh, I do take issue with her statement that every single uh, claim that is reported to an agency is reported to the law department. That has certainly not been my uh, experience as a practitioner of workers' compensation before the, bo before the board for 22 years. Uh, as, in fact, my experience is that the vast majority of workers' compensation claims in terms of occupationally related illnesses, occupational disease or repetitive trauma claims, are significantly underreported by the agency to the law department. I have no doubt that the law department notifies the workers' compensation board of every report it receives from an agency, but that's a different question, and that's a different statement to be made as to whether or not the agency reports it to the law department. I have uh, many clients. Uh, I do a lot of work with the UFT, uh, a lot of paraprofessionals. Uh, and they tell me that I go to my job to try to report an occupational illness, a uh, repetitive trauma type of claim, and they tell me that since it's not a specific accident and I can't give them a specific accident date, that they cannot fill out the incident report, which tri then triggers the report to the law department. Uh, so I couldn't disagree more with Ms. Roller's statements that occupational injuries, occupational diseases, repetitive trauma claims uh, should be excluded from this report. I think that is where the information that is requested by these amendments will have the most impact, as a matter of fact, especially not only with the reporting of uh, claims to the law department, but also with the uh, ability to uh, develop uh, safety programs, because the safety programs that you're trying to develop based upon job title are really there to try to uh, eliminate hazards that occur on a day-to-day -day basis. You're never going to be able to completely eliminate someone tripping over a wire at work. But if there is something that is inherent in their workplace, in their job title that is causing them to suffer an occupational injury at work, those are the types of things that targeted, uh, targeted uh, educational and uh, safety programs uh, should be able to eliminate if you can find out what is causing the problem. Okay, okay. Um, before I, I call the next panel, I do just want, I know that Mr. Schufer, that, 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 that many years ago in, in, in our encounters together in your, in your hat as the, the chair of, of NICOSH over there, some of the industry things that concerned us was things like, like deep vein thrombosis, right, and, and whether or not, and subsequently the persons that were making that argument, argument the most frequently um, ended up passing on be, because of that, the amount of time that, that workers send behind us, behind the desk, in this case, behind the wheel of, of a bus or in the cabin of a train, um, the impact on that, that currently would not be captured. Is that correct? And, and as the reporting is done now, as you said, there's not a specific accident. That is a long-term uh, uh, accumulation of, of workplace condition that kind of causes this to happen. They, and, and, and current reporting would current not capture reporting such that a, 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 there, a it is. Uh, they're rarely caught in, in the reporting, and they surely are not record, recorded uh, unless the, the, the there are the, the occupational diseases that I, I believe that when they are when the occupational diseases are reported in this system, they are recorded. But the, the problem is that most occupational diseases are not uh, caught and. Uh, Generally, workers end up going to see their 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 doctor and get them treated as regular diseases. Most doctors are not trained to recognize occupational diseases, and so th we essentially socialize the cost of of occupational diseases uh, through uh, health general health care. Agree. Um, so uh, we're going to call the next panel. I want to thank everybody for their testimony. Certainly, uh, we'll be 
getting back to folks with additional questions, but uh, all of your testimony is greatly appreciated and, and much helpful in today's hearings. Uh, next panel, uh, Jessica Perez, Manosa Daisy Aleto, uh, Caitlin Pierce, Paul Son, We're missing a member of the panel. Who we got? Paul Song. Paul Song. Paul Song. Paul Song. Hi, my name is Jess Perez. I want to start by thanking City Councilman Brad Lander for proposing this bill. I think this bill has the potential to single-handedly dismantle the abuse that is so deeply ingrained in the fashion industry, an industry that I've been a part of for almost 20 years. Let me explain to you why this bill is so important. Imagine if Uber forced its drivers to sign non-compete contracts as freelancers, leaving them without the option to drive for Lyft or other competitors. Then imagine if Uber didn't have enough passengers for the drivers, leaving them to sit around, not making money, not able to pay their bills. If this sounds crazy to you, it's because it is. But it's not Uber that operates this way, it's the entire fashion industry. In the fashion industry, models are forced into exclusive contracts with agencies. Otherwise, it's impossible to work with a reputable agency. These exclusive contracts dictate that models are only allowed to take jobs from one agency per city, even when that agency is not actually finding them work. These contracts create what is at the core of every abusive relationship, an imbalance in power. When someone contractually owns you, they treat you like they own you. These contracts allow agencies to get away with unimaginable behavior because if models don't comply, they lose the ability to make money in their profession. Agencies also don't provide health insurance or any guaranteed compensation, but they do require models to be available exclusively to them at their beck and call. When I was forced to sign my first exclusive contract, a lawyer I consulted with said to me, and I quote, this is what I would imagine a contract between a pimp and a prostitute would be like if they had contracts. I was told by my agency that this type of contract is standard in this industry and they were right. I want to ask you today, what would you do if your livelihood was forcibly dependent on one agency and they didn't find you work? I'll tell you what you would do. Your daily actions would be driven by a state of desperation. I ask you today to take the position that this standard is no longer acceptable and prevent people from having to stay in a working relationship riddled with abuse, broke, and bound. Thank you. My name is Daisy Alioto. Oops. Got it, sorry about that. My name is Daisy Alioto, and I have been a full-time freelancer since January 2017. Although I have written for outlets as prestigious as the Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, and Time Magazine, it would be impossible for me to support myself as a full-time writer. Instead, I supplement my income by doing social media strategy and marketing for publications, restaurants, bars, and fashion brands. The skills I use to freelance in the corporate world are consistent ac across clients. If I were asked to sign a non-compete, it would be a significant blow to my income. The legislation under consideration today is common sense, just like the Freelance Isn't Free Act is common sense. Here, we have an opportunity to do more. Workers should be paid for the work they complete, and they shouldn't be punished for offering the same skills to multiple clients. Unfortunately, 
if we do not formalize these industry standards, bad actors will use any loophole available to avoid common sense. And trust me, I have seen some truly nefarious practices. I have participated in boycotts, open letters, and work stoppages across against poor labor practices in the media industry at personal financial cost. New York City has already shown itself to be sensitive to the needs of the freelance working population, which is growing by the day. In November 2018, I published a piece about social media influencers, the Instagram famous personalities who mix sponsored posts about hotels and accessories among original content. These influencers are often derided but have more in common with freelance writers and fashion models than not. Through my reporting, I learned that late payments, exploitative contracts, and lack of affordable health insurance options were of great concern to these independent bloggers. For the past six months, I have volunteered my time to organize other digital media workers into a new division of the National Writers Union, dedicated to the interests of the media gig economy worker where I have seen shared grievances with those I listed above. Despite the rising cost of living in New York, my peers make their homes here because it is the city where they can build their careers. So much of the industry I work in is based in New York. This bill has the power to make that work safer, fairer, and better for myself and my peers. In order to attract, keep, and champion freelance talent, the New York City Council should move to pass the bill at hand without delay. But please do not stop here. There is work to be done to raise standards across the freelance economy. Thank you. Good morning. Oh. Good morning, my name is Caitlin Pierce and I'm the Executive Director of Freelancers Union. Um, I wanna thank the committee um, and Council Member Brad Lander uh, for sponsoring this bill. I'm here today to represent the 150,000 New York City members of Freelancers Union to testify in support of the bill to protect freelancers from potential loss of income due to non-compete clauses. Freelancers are a huge and important part of the fabric of New York City. They live and work in every borough. We represent 36% of the American workforce and contribute over a trillion dollars annually to the economy. Freelancers rely on a diverse set of income streams and work on average bet with between five to seven clients each month. Because their income is unpredictable and often sporadic, they must constantly prospect for new clients and develop new streams of income. As independent contractors who work without employment benefits, freelancers deserve to retain this autonomy to seek work in their field without restriction or fear of repercussion from existing clients. Their livelihoods depend on it. Freelancers must negotiate with companies as individuals and have few legal protections governing their work agreements. Um, for these reasons, they routinely struggle to negotiate fair work contracts. I frequently hear from members who feel compelled to sign unfavorable agreements, feeling that their choice is really between signing the contract or going out to look for other work. When it comes to non-competes, freelancers often feel compelled to sign unfavorable agreements to secure the income that they need now while potentially foregoing future income opportunities. Um, with these conditions in mind, we are concerned about the provision in the bill which states that non-competes would be allowable should the hiring parties guarantee, uh, and I quote, payment of reasonable monetary sum that is mutually acceptable to both the hiring party and the freelance worker. Um, our specific concern here is whether freelancers would reasonably be able to negotiate a sum on top of their freelancing fee that would be sufficiently advantageous. Um, we would instead advocate for a complete restriction of non-compete clauses in freelance work agreements. The enactment of the Freelance Isn't Free Law, uh, which went into effect in May 2017, established a private right of action for freelancers with non-payment issues, as well as a channel for reporting claims to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, uh, which helps freelancers resolve their claims through navigation and outreach to hiring parties. Since then, the city has helped hundreds of freelancers collect over $1 million without them having to hire an attorney or go to court. Um, we believe this is incredibly successful um, and have been, and been really glad to partner with the city on this. 
Uh, we believe a similar approach would be effective in dealing with non-compete issues, whereby the city would play a role in enforcing the law by helping workers navigate claims, notifying companies of violations, and investigating and penalizing repeat offenders. Finally, hiring parties benefit when they enable the free flow of work within their field. Companies rely on freelancers to bring specialized skills and creative talents to their businesses, and they benefit from the diverse experiences and entrepreneurial activity that freelancers bring to their work every day. The New York City Council is led by example in protecting freelancers from non-payment, in establishing minimum wage for app-based drivers, and in recognizing the challenges faced by workers in the new economy. And by, on behalf of Freelancers Union, I urge City Council to pass a limit on non-competes in order to the strengthen worker protections and freelance livelihoods. Thank you. I'm Paul Son. I'm, I'm State Policy Program Director with the National Employment Law Project. We're a uh, workers' rights uh, policy organization. We work nationally um, at the federal, state, and local levels, and we've been delighted to work closely with the City Council on a number of, of important measures. We testify in strong support of, of this, this proposal to, uh, to significantly limit uh, or, or prohibit altogether uh, non-competes for freelancers. There's been growing, I'm gonna just present oral testimony and we will supplement with written testimony shortly or early next week. The key, the, uh, the key points here though are that nationally there's been growing attention on the, the, uh, the unfair role of non-competes in the employment context in locking uh, employees into often low paying jobs and pre preventing uh, them from uh, improving their incomes through mo mobility. And many states are starting to step in and prohibit them. The general trend has been to prohibit them except for highly compensated individuals who plausibly have access to trade secrets, especially in the tech se sector, and some states prohibit them altogether. That's sort of the, the movement for employees, but for this is really the first I was aware of their use for freelancers, and it seems like the policy rationales, as Council Member Lander uh, flagged earlier, for applying them for freelancers really don't obtain at all. The two chief reasons that employers cite for, for non-competes are in order to um, so that they can safely invest in training and in sort of the human capital of employees without having them immediately jump ship to work for a competitor. You know, that, that really doesn't apply to freelancers who are con don't have any long-term commitment from their, their clients and are constantly having to, to, uh, to, to, to scramble w uh, for work. The second rationale is, is trade secrets, and uh, often it's argued that it's, uh, diff it's difficult to, to prevent uh, disclosure of trade secrets through non-disclosure requirements if a, a, an employee goes to another company and that's what therefore a non-compete is uh, the most practical w means of preventing disclosure of, of trade secrets an employee has learned. You know, and again, freelancers, you know, it don't, you know, it's rare would be the circumstance where a freelancer would gain access to specialized trade secrets. It really feels like that policy rationale doesn't obtain either. So we would strongly support, uh, but conversely, the, uh, the, the harmful role of non-competes in preventing employees from uh, shopping around for the best paying job, especially freelancers who have no, no guaranteed annual salary are, are very, very serious. So we would, we would strongly support the council you know, eliminating them or significantly restricting them. In my remaining moments, I'd just like to flag, we also testify in support of intro 1321A, the, uh, the uh, subsidized affordable housing property services prevailing wage law. I've submitted written testimony. Um, we, you know, uh, ensuring fair wages for uh, property service workers um, uh, in, in subsidized uh, affordable housing is of a piece with the, the, the uh, significant progress the council's been making to raise job and living standards for low wage workers in the city. Um, that we already are successfully applying property service prevailing wage laws to most large uh, development projects. The uh, carve out for affordable housing is something we have not seen in other cities. Conver many other cities apply their, their uh, fair wage standards to all subsidized development projects, including affordable housing. Um, the uh, experience in the areas that have been rezoned shows they can be practically applied to in such areas, and we would strongly support uh, the legislation to uh, extend those, those, those basic wage standards to affordable housing projects as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to kick it off to, to Council Member Landon because you have essentially asked my, uh, the few questions that I uh, wanted to know about um, uh, uh, the industry's reason for particular policies and, and, and uh, you 
laid out very well the two reasons that they would would apply in these cases here and why they don't necessarily apply as well. So thank you for your insight with that. Councilman Milan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll extend my thanks for a, a very helpful and enlightening panel and also, you know, from before that, helping build the organizing strength for this work. It builds off the Freelancers and Free Act, so thank you, Ms. Pierce and the Freelancers Union, uh, and Ms. Perez, it comes directly from your uh, outreach and testimony at that time, highlighting our attention on this uh, problem uh, in the fashion industry especially, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I guess I want to drill down a little bit more on this question of how to handle um, whether they should be prohibited entirely in freelance space or whether some minimum standard should be established above which you have to go before you can do it. I agree that the bill as drafted doesn't, is not sufficient because, you know, I think you could probably satisfy the bill by saying, well, you get $1,000 a month and then, you know, whatever, and just kind of in the force uh, folks to accept that agreement, just like they're forced to accept an agreement now that has nothing. So mutually agreed at some minimum standard that's low is insufficient. But you can imagine going one of two directions, just saying you can't have non-competes uh, in freelance space, and if you want to hire someone and offer a non-compete, then you could go with whatever the standard was for employees and have to, have to hire them as a traditional employee full-time benefits. I don't know what the New York State standard is and whether it's high enough to prevent non-competes unless that job is of a sufficient level. The other approach would be to say, okay, let's sort of mirror that and say there are industries where it makes sense for it to be done freelance, but we're gonna set a high bar. It, wouldn't, it couldn't just be a mutually agreed low one, but we'd have to set some standard for what a sufficient kind of living wage with protections would look like, and I, I'm not sure which of the, you know, one, one way or the other it'll make sense to amend this bill, and I, I wonder if you have a sense on whether we should aim to prohibit them entirely for freelance workers or try to find a way to establish a, a, a high enough threshold so that if you're above that, you're really a member of that team, you know, you're being fairly compensated, you have some perhaps other benefits or or protections that are sensible to trade for the kinds of the reason, you know, at that point maybe you're getting some uh, training, workforce development, you're part of a team in a way that might mean you'd have things that you wouldn't, you know, you shouldn't share with other companies. So any of you can respond to that. I mean, our, my feeling is that it's really goes against the spirit of freelance work, which is about independent contracting and is about being able to have a diverse portfolio of work. Uh, without restriction. Uh, I could imagine there's a scenario in which a freelancer would be willing to sign an exclusive agreement and see it as beneficial if they were able to negotiate an extra sum of money for that. I think practically speaking, though, our concern would be that the freelancers that were well positioned to negotiate those types of agreements are, are not the same group of freelancers who we need to protect through this law. Um, and I would be interested to learn more about what the specifics would be in the modeling industry, which I'm not as deeply familiar with, but um, that was sort of our perspective. I, I totally agree with you, Caitlin. I think that, um, at least in the modeling industry, I can't really think of any circumstance under which you would have to sign an exclusive contract with an agency. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, the way that it currently operates has just led to an extremely abusive relationship between agencies and their models and sometimes photographers and other kinds of people that have that same kind of relationship. Um, I think this is what freelancing is about, right? You're supposed to be able to make your own decisions and otherwise someone can pay you for your health insurance and pay for your benefits and pay for your retirement. And I think that the way that in a lot of industries is structured right now, we don't get any of the benefits, but then we're tied to this agency or, or corporation or whatever it is that is dictating how much money we are actually able to make. And oftentimes in the modeling industry, I mean, even when you said $1,000 a month, I think there's a lot of models that would be happy to get just $1,000 a month from their agencies. But I think that knowing, knowing the industry, I think if there's any kind of loophole or any kind of way for the agencies to be able to get away with um, not setting up the models in the best position possible, they would probably take that route 
And so I think the, the standard has to be extremely high. Maybe if you're a freelancer that has some kind of intellectual property or something like that, uh, maybe that, that could apply. But I don't see how in the majority of freelancing industries it would, it would make sense to have an exclusive contract. I would also add, um, when you put the burden on the freelancer to negotiate a rate based on future income that they would be missing out on, firstly, that income is very hard to predict. Next month, a client could come to me, say Nike, and offer me a, a phenomenal freelance contract and rate based on skills I'm using with another client currently. And I can't predict that that opportunity is coming. And I also don't want to lose out on that income by signing a non-compete with the client I work with today. The other thing is, any time there is a point of negotiation to set a rate, the people who in the freelance industry are most vulnerable are also vulnerable to the pressure to accept the rate that's offered to them because they don't know that other people are being paid higher. And I can speak from personal experience from a time when I was starting out, I found out that there was a male freelancer who was paid more than $1,000 for the same amount of work that I did. So uh, these inequalities really come into play when the burden is on the freelancer to negotiate and to take that option off the table and really say, we're not gonna allow you to offer compensation at all in exchange for a non-compete would help the people that are more marginalized in the industry and in negotiation processes in general. All right, that's really helpful and, and definitely inclines me toward just removing the, uh, the exemption entirely. And if what we're saying is there's a point at which if you had full-time work and you were fully compensated and you had benefits and you were sufficiently on the team to get training uh, and protect, perhaps participate in knowing the company's secrets, like that's called having a full-time job with benefits. And if someone wants to offer you that, they can offer you that. If you're continuing to freelance, then you shouldn't be expected to sign a non-compete, and then that would provide at least the basic protections that we're talking about here. So we'll, we'll follow up with each of you uh, afterwards. But thank you for uh, this testimony on relatively short notice as well. Um, it's really very, very helpful, and look forward to working with you to move this bill forward and see it become law. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Mr. Much. Chairman. Thank you. And thank you again for helping make it possible for us to have the hearing. Absolutely. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you to the panel for, for your testimony and your insight and, and helping us to move along so that we can ensure that all workers have the dignity that they respect. So we're calling our next panel now, Joseph Rosenberg, Patrick Boyle, Esmini, Esmini. Esmini. No, Esmini. Who is she? I, I saw her, yeah. And, and Lauren, Lauren Lamatt. So we can start from either end, but here's what's happened when you show up late. We start at this end. <laughs> Ismini. I always defer to Ismini anyway. Thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman and Councilman, uh, for having um, us here today on this extremely, extremely important um, issue. Uh, I, uh, my name is Ismini Spiliotis. I'm the Executive Director of Mahani Management, Inc., a 30-year nonprofit community and housing development corporation. Uh, you know me, so I will not waste my three minutes. Um, I wanted to um, talk today because, 
actually asking for some resets and reconsiderations on intro 1321A. And um, I wanted to provide you with some concrete information and then be very supportive of my um, colleagues in the uh, affordable housing world, both the nonprofit and the and the for-profit affordable housing um, developers. I went back into one of our budgets, uh, and I just, just for the record, I just want um, folks to know that Manny um, is a union shop, so our maintenance staff are union. Um, they, uh, we have members in Local 670, RDSW, and we have members in 32BJ. So this is not uh, something that um, I'm talking about kind of um, uh, in concept alone. This is, uh, I, I, you know, we know what the costs are, um, and, uh, and, and I just want to also say that the numbers, both the RDSW and the um, and the uh, uh, 32BJ numbers are not the uh, prevailing wage numbers, okay? They are actually below. And one of the big items that's of a concern to me is that prevailing wage is a definitive term, right? It's, it's got a schedule attached to it. And uh, Manny is going to be building a building in East New York uh, with, um, with Cypress Hills, and that uh, when we went uh, to get that number from the wage scale, um, the porter salary was actually $84,000, okay? And so, uh, uh, which all of my staff wanted to resign and become porters. And so I think that um, it was a number that uh, an initial run on the, on the pro forma was really prohibitive and in fact resulted in us asking for additional subsidy to cover this uh, affordable housing development. But the housing development itself is, um, is, is a, a huge building, 275 unit building with, um, um, with uh, 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 income levels from homeless to, uh, to, to uh, 60 to, to 80 percent AMI. So it is a very affordable development and it was very impactful on the budget. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that, you know, so we have both current numbers to kind of talk about what happens and uh, pro projected numbers in a rezoned area. Um, and I have more, but I'm out of time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lauren Lamack, uh, Housing Development Project Manager on behalf of Services for the Underserved, or SUS. SUS is one of New York City's largest not-for-profit social service and housing organizations. Founded in 1979, SUS is a 501 organization that provides services and support to transform the lives of over 35,000 of New York's most valuable vulnerable citizens, including people with disabilities, people in poverty, and people facing homelessness. Our organization envisions a city where everyone has a roof over their head and everyone is able to live a healthy, productive life full of meaningful social connections and purpose. We believe in approaching the complex challenges that each person faces as a whole, with housing often being a vital, vital component. Last year, SUS provided housing and shelter to more than 4,500 New Yorkers on any given night. As the City Council well knows, New York City faces a growing need for affordable, stable, stable housing for individuals and families. SUS understands and appreciates the intent behind intro 1321A, but believes it will lead to unintended consequences. Specifically, a reduced number of affordable and supportive housing units being built and preserved in New York City. While an amendment to intro 1321A was made to exempt some supportive housing projects, additional amendments are imperative to protecting the housing and services for people in our communities that need them to live full, stable lives. SUS supports a carve-out in intro 1321A for all nonprofit operated human services programs in all residential developments that are committed by regulatory agreement to rent to households earning on average 80% of AMI. As part of the effort to house our most vulnerable citizens and decrease the homeless census, SUS develops and operates both supportive housing and housing for low-income individuals and households for whom circumstances have left them in need of a stable home. Not all of the developments, not all of the supportive housing and low-income housing is included in the bill's current carve-out. 
For many of the developments SUS and similar organizations plan to pursue, this bill requires prevailing wage into the annual operating budget, therefore increasing the cost of such developments without adding any additional income to support such increases. With higher operating costs, buildings can afford lower monthly mortgage payments, which thereby results in a gap of capital funding, which would need to be offset by an increase in city and state subsidy. On average, these additional subsidy needs could cost the city and state up to 9,300 per unit. A recent analysis of one of SUS's developments in pre-development showed that when calculated with prevailing wages, the subsidy need increased by $2.29 million. With construction costs and land prices soaring, this is not the time to add additional expense to the development of low-income housing and further deplete resources intended to constru construct housing for our most vulnerable neighbors. In addition to the effect on development budgets and subsidy needs, the regulations of intro 1321A will have a substantial negative impact on many of the other residential programs. We are facing a homelessness crisis in New York City. Tens of thousands of men, women, and children sleep on our streets and in our shelters. To decrease the number of people without homes in our city, we need to build more low-income housing and support the programs that help stabilize their lives and look forward to a brighter future. This is not the time to add additional financial strain on the resources that can make these goals a reality and break the cycle of homelessness. Thanks to Chair Miller. My name is Patrick Boyle. I'm the Director of Policy at NYSAFA. The New York State Association for Affordable Housing, or NYSAFA, is the trade association for New York's affordable housing industry. With over 350 member firms involved in the development, construction, financing, and design of affordable housing all throughout the state. Our members create housing across the entire affordable spectrum, including mixed-use developments, middle-income or workforce housing, supportive housing, low-income housing and affordable housing with homeless set-asides, and 100% affordable projects. Intro 1321A will provide higher wages for building service workers on some affordable housing projects. Although this is a laudable goal, it comes at the expense of affordable housing production, a trade-off that we want to stress to the Council today as it considers advancing this legislation. We would also like to suggest a more robust carve-out that would protect more supportive housing, as well as other types of affordable housing intended for low-income New Yorkers. For affordable housing projects, the income of a building is fixed because the rents are set at their respective AMI, area median income levels, and cannot be raised to cover higher expenses. An unfunded new wage mandate will lead to an increase in operating costs and a need for government to step in with more subsidy to keep the project from going underwater. Subsidy is limited. Additional demands on it stretch it even thinner, and subsidy being used to cover prevailing wages means less subsidy for the next project in the pipeline. Ultimately, that means less affordable housing at a time when I'm sure we can all agree the city needs it more desperately than ever. This reality was understood by the drafters of Local Law 27 of 2012, which contained a carve-out for affordable housing projects. To weaken that carve-out in the midst of an affordable housing crisis with record, number, record numbers of homeless New Yorkers and far too few units being created is a blow. It comes alongside other challenges to affordable housing production, including President Trump's damaging tariffs, skyrocketing construction costs, and out-of-control land prices throughout the city. The A version of this bill has recognized the outside impact that it would have on supportive housing specifically and carved some of those projects out. That is an important and welcome start, and we thank you for it. However, as you have heard and will hear from others testifying today, it is inadequate and the Council must go further to protect other types of low-income housing. As the city pivots and attempts to have its housing plan reach lower income New Yorkers as well as the formerly homeless, goals supported by, NIS by NYSAFA and our advocacy partners, this measure without a clearer and stronger carve out for those projects would hurt that effort. I'll skip to that carve out with limited time here. NYSAFA, we understand the public benefit of higher wages to the hard working men and women who staff these buildings. However, such a mandate should be limited to those projects that can afford them, projects with market rate units or high AMI levels, and that can do so without further constraining valuable and limited city subsidy. That's why with other affordable and supportable, supportive housing advocates, we endorse a carve out for low income projects defined as those that are affordable to households earning 80% AMI on average. Thank you again for your time and to the chair. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and Council Member Brand, uh, Lander. I'm Joseph Rosenberg, Director of the Catholic Community Relations Council, representing today the Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn. I'm here to uh, 
happy here to discuss uh, intro 1321A and to highlight the important role that uh, nonprofit housing organizations play in providing permanent housing for the most vulnerable populations in our city. We have strong concerns with this bill. We support the rights of workers, but this bill would require nonprofits and affordable housing developers to provide prevailing wages to building service workers if the development receives $1 million or more in city financial assistance. This is very broadly defined, and practically all nonprofits who partner with New York City to construct or preserve low income housing would be covered by this bill. As a result, if passed, this bill becomes an unfunded mandate for nonprofits and religious institutions. It will severely strain our financial ability to house low income New Yorkers, including the formerly homeless. The need to develop and preserve low income housing increases daily. Nonprofit and religious institutions, whose charitable and faith based mission is to produce housing for the poor, the formerly homeless, and people with special needs already have scarce financial resources to support their housing programs and their extensive human service provider operations. Current law provides an exception from this mandate for nonprofits and affordable housing developers, but this bill eliminates this exemption. This existing exemption is an acknowledgment of the important role that these organi organizations have always played in New York over the decades. We urge that this exemption for those who develop and preserve low-income housing be restored. Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn have played an indispensable role in our city for over 100 years in addressing the needs of the poor, the elderly, the refugee, the immigrant, the disabled, and the homeless. The housing divisions of Catholic Charities have provided permanent housing for thousands of low-income New Yorkers. These are exactly the kind of developments needed in this city to house populations that are so often ignored and forgotten. Catholic Charities are continuing this commitment with over 11 buildings in the pre-development stage. All projects will be over 100 units and are built with the intent of maximizing the number of apartments for low-income and formerly homeless New Yorkers. The bill does not just cover future developments, but also our existing buildings, most of which are Section 202 and Section 8 housing, because their they aging building systems require renovation, rehabilitation, and accordingly, a lot of the money that they will need will be part of the $1 million of city financial assistance, which is their only source of generating this much needed funding for renovation. Although 1321A has been recently amended to exempt developments that provide 60% of their units for supportive housing, that language is short-sighted. It does not take into consideration the challenges facing nonprofits who develop low-income housing for other needy populations. The unfunded mandates of this bill would still apply to developments that house frail elderly, small percentages of supportive housing, homeless veterans, homeless families living in shelters, the working poor, and homeless individuals with special needs. We therefore request that you exempt nonprofit organizations and affordable housing developers who construct and preserve this low-income housing from this bill. Thank you. Councilman Milan. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I appreciate the folks on this panel. I am a former member of the affordable housing not-for-profit development community. And, and in that time, when I was at Fifth Avenue Committee, we were not signatory with 32BJ or RW. So I, you know, I appreciate the perspective you're coming from. I guess the question I want to ask, though, is you know, if it's an unfunded mandate, I sure hear you. Uh, it's on us to reckon with the cost that this would cost and to make sure it's provided. But uh, I guess I want to understand a little better, assuming we could make it a funded mandate, and that, you know, that HPD number that they gave of 9,300 a unit or, <laughs> unit or whatever we determined to be true was built into the capital financing of the project, what the problem then is. Like, it'd be great if a lot of things cost less. It'd be great if the land was cheaper. It would be great if, you know, it could come go through. But we don't get to say to landowners, well, we'd rather pay you half that. So, you know, uh, uh, that we'll lose the project. So it just this one feels like because we can push the workers package down, we have. And if we decide the right thing to do as a city is to pay it. You know, so I, you know, most of, you know, all the arguments which are, if we don't get the money, this will be impossible for us, I hear. But assume for a minute that what would happen is that the, the money would be put into the capital budget sufficient to underwrite the projects, presuming the prevailing wage, and, and help me understand <coughs> in that case why there should be exemptions or what the, what the problem would be with the law. So I'm, I, can I, I, 
So, so Brad, thank you for the question, Councilman. Um, I, um, as I started to say, so prevailing wage, okay, is a statutory term, and it comes with a wage scale, okay, and uh, and so there is absolutely once you vote that, there's no room for negotiation. Okay, that's like that's the number. And like I said, it's actually in some cases, whether it's the Bronx or other negotiated deals or other unions, it's actually a higher number than even signatory organizations are paying. And so, 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 just to the capital question. But but one that we know in it, I mean, it, obviously it, all it things is, change right. in the long term. Guess, the right. price so, of oil right. changes, no, a ton of no, things change. Fine. But we know it in advance. Right. We could underwrite the you, deal based right. on what it is you, you, today. You, you could. It's true. Okay. I think for me and the reason I mentioned the 84,000 and my staff is that, um, and I think when you read uh, folks' testimony, you'll see that especially in supportive housing buildings, but in other buildings or even just the staff of the organization. Okay. And again, you could say, great, well, you We'll, we'll give everyone prevailing wage. That <laughs> we can't do that. But you've got daycare workers, you've got service workers, you've got social workers, you've got counselors, you've got asset managers. You have this entire other staff that actually uh, kind of really interact with your maintenance staff, and they're getting paid sometimes really, really uh, um, well below even what our, we're currently paying you know, the maintenance folks, union or prevailing wage or non-union. And so I think for me, uh, when I look at it, there's, a, a, there's an issue of equity. So if you're gonna, if you, you know, and looking at how are we going to kind of, um, how am I gonna look at you in the face every day at work and be like, I'm getting $25 an hour and you're getting, Eighty dollars an hour, whatever it is, you know, there's an, for me, there's an issue of equity. I, I mean, I really hear you that there's a pay parity question. This council just took up pay parity in our budget, but it feels like exempting not-for-profits just creates a different pay parity in equity, which is to say, the building service workers in for-profit buildings will be paid well, and building service workers in non-profit buildings will be paid poorly. So, like, we're, we have a pay parity problem somewhere, and I think I'd rather address it by elevating more rather than yeah and so more. so what if you read my test if you actually read what I didn't get to and and you read uh, and others I mean so so one strategy is this carve out and the carve out uh, 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 really a allows the housing dollars that we're all aware of now to go farther and that's the argument you're hearing right and 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 it also creates some pay parity within the nonprofit community but it doesn't solve you know it doesn't create a level playing field no it creates pay parity downward rather okay. than trying okay. to keep pulling no, it I know except that, that that there isn't a plan to, to to pay all those other people I mean that's the problem right but but the other issue is, um, so, so if, if you look at my testimony, this idea of um, either some kind of, and that's why I keep going back to this idea of not calling it prevailing wage, which is again, I, or not setting it to prevailing wage, but figuring out what are, like so I would argue probably that there are nonprofits and for-profits that pay too little, and, and others that pay better, you know, this, it's a spectrum of pay, right? Equity aside. And so the question is, how do you get to equity? How do you balance equity, um, good pay, with equity, with capital dollars, right? Like, how do you get to that nexus? And how do you get to it in a luxury building? I mean, Councilman Kalos was here before, and he says, in my neighborhood, well, his neighborhood, I would argue, has like a lot of very expensive housing with doormen and you know and 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 could support a prevailing wage and a building in the south bronx or in brooklyn might not have that same uh operating budget to to cover that so does that mean that the person in east new york should get paid less okay that's the question right okay just because they're working in a manny building instead of a upper east side building right that would be the question you would ask me and i would say um to a number, you know what I mean? Like what is, you know, so does that mean they should only make 30% uh, of AMI because the AMI in that neighborhood's 30%? No, okay, so what, like, so what gets really sticky maybe is what's the right number? That's really scary to, you know, that's not sticky. I mean, that's a conversation to, to be had. And so the question is, is it prevailing wage? Is it where we are now? Or is it some other conversation about what the right pay scale is that gets us to this balance of equity? Uh, parity and uh, resources. 
Thank you, Council Member Lander. And um, I, so they brought out the secret weapon today, who happens to be one of my <laughs> favorite persons in, in, in the affordable housing industry. But I, I, I'm not sure if, if because there's been a lot of testimony early. I, I recall Council Member Adams talking about um, not necessarily calling it community board preference, but looking at the number of how many folks from these communities where affordable housing is being developed actually inhabit and are residents, right? And I think they said the number was somewhere around 40%. Um, and other places a little higher. Um, so if, if we kind of just take into consideration the dynamic of all the testimony that we've heard thus far today, um, I, I kind of want to move it in a different direction. If, in fact, um, the city is two things now, as, as Council Member Landis said, um, if it requires, if the city can't do it on its own, it requires this partnership. Partners require additional support. How do we get there, right? And so we need to have this information going. But we also need to look at this thing holistically and say, is this precisely the model that we need to do in order for us to maintain affordable housing throughout? Right, because we have sometimes what we're seeing, what we're talking about in theory here is the deeply affordable housing, right? And, and what, what is being done on that end there. And that there's a specific model with a specific group of developers that have to be involved in order to achieve that goal of affordability. I would submit that there are models out there that is more of a microcosm of communities where it represents all the varying incomes and all the people that need it, because everybody needs affordable housing. I think that market rate, no matter where you are, is just off the chart, right? But there is communities and the ability to sustain these models, not just in development, but as we move forward in maintenance. Are we looking at models that more encompass what communities really are? Mm -hmm as opposed to doing 70, 80, 90, 100 over here, doing 30, 40 over here. And if we made it more of a microcosm of what communities are, um, creating a community, but also creating the ability to pay for what we're looking at, then can we afford to pay wages, to pay living and <coughs> failing wages to workers so that it becomes a more sustainable universe. Should we be looking at that model instead of just locking in to saying, this is what we do, this is how we do it, and we cannot afford to do it in this way? I'd just like to add one thing to that, uh, Chair Mill, if I might. One of the, one of the uh, items that specifically concern us in the legislation is the threshold of uh, 100 units. Um, the vast majority of all of our developments exceed 100 units by a tremendous amount because they're built on church-owned land, and the charitable and faith-based mission of the church is to try to maximize this amount of housing to the extent possible. So the irony here is, and this would harm us because we are trying to create a product that is in desperate need, and instead of doing 80 units, which would perhaps provide some protection from legislation of this nature, we're doing 120, 220, 330 units. So that's just another concern that we have with the, the existing draft of intro uh, 1321A. Uh, Again, I would submit that if it's, particularly if you're doing two, 300 units, that, that there is space for, for a varying AMI that would allow for the resources that would pay for it, um, it particularly you know, as, as, as I travel through communities throughout, the, there, I don't think that there are any communities that are specifically at 30 or 40 percent, that they are working families, that there are indigenous working families that exist throughout the city that have nowhere to live, have nowhere to go, and could support, who are looking for uh, affordable housing as well. Most of our uh, buildings are way under 80% AMI. We do not make our operating margins as current. So it is a dilemma, and we appreciate the fact that you provide us with so much time to discuss this very important issue. Yeah, we, we should discuss it, because I think that for some, somehow we're, we're, we're dismissing the notion that affordable housing, uh, and, and subsidies should go to a, only a specific group uh, 
of development and and that 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 we are not addressing holistically the need and if we did that that I think that we can encompass a, a, a greater um, group capture a larger audience in, in doing so um, but it's certainly something to talk about right because within these communities that we're talking about if we're going to capture that 40 50 percent and I'd like it to be definitely higher in terms of community community preferences um, then we'd have to capture that universe of, of working families as well that that meet those other AMIs as well. And I think that that would resolve some of, at least begin to resolve some of our resource concerns. I can give you a specific, it's interesting, um, Jeremy. Uh, uh, so basically when you look at the underwriting, okay, when you're putting these deals together, um, what you find, and I, I, I don't know if the people, when they did the low income housing tax credits in the 1980s, if they had this in mind or if it just happened to work out this way. But basically, you know, you hear the 60% number all the time, right? Because the 60% until they started this new rule with income average, I won't get into the technical details, but basically for the last, uh, almost 40 years, 35 years, you know, the, 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 the cutoff in the, in the funding, you know, was this 60% number, okay, 60% of AMI. And so what's interesting is that the rent, 30% of 60%, okay? So 60% right now is about $60,000 for a family of four. And, the, and so 30% of, of that number is what uh, that, family would pay towards rent. What's interesting about that number is it's approximately the number that it costs to operate a building when you're getting a tax abatement. Okay, so it's so that number, interestingly enough, is somehow magical. Okay, it's kind of if you if you look at the math. So when you start to look at your neighborhood and you're thinking, okay, I really want to address the fact that not every single person in this neighborhood is at 60% AMI. Okay, I've got people at 10, 20, 30, 40, 80, 90, 100, right? I've got this blind range. And so what happens is when you underwrite to 50, 40, 30, you need subsidy, right? You would need subsidy. And then again, we might have to pay the mortgage also. So you need, so you need more. And then if you're writing to 70, 80, 90, just to maintain your building, then you would actually make a little extra money. All right, so you have a little extra money when you go over 60, and you have a little, and you have less money when you go under 60, right? And so then, so you put this, you put this package together. So you're asking, okay, what would that mix need to be in order to add in uh, another, you know, to pay, let's call it prevailing wage, or to pay a number that's a higher wage than we may be paying our, 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 our maintenance workers right now, right? What, what's that number? And then what happens to that income mix or what happened, you know, so we've been talking about it as a, uh, as a need for more subsidy, and you're asking, okay, that's one way to do it, or if you change your income mix, maybe it makes up for it, and you don't need more subsidy because you actually have this wider band of incomes, right? And I think that the issue is, and in the supportive housing world in particular, where the costs of operating that housing are so much more than like a regular building, okay? That um, it doesn't actually equal out that way, okay? So that's just in a regular building without supportive services. Once you add in the supportive housing population, that number just goes skyrockets. And so then your mix would suddenly have to be very different weighing to the higher income folks. And as Joe said, that's really problematic because the people that we are both mission driven and what the data shows, unfortunately, is the people that we need to be housing are on the lower end of the spectrum. So there's no problem with creating the mix. The problem is that the need for more units is on the lower end. You compound that with the need for supportive housing. You compound that with an additional um, a, a prevailing wage number on services and suddenly you're not sustaining it. Okay, so this is definitely a offline. We need to go further into it because I think that I've seen, I've witnessed, been a part of a more sustainable model 
um, where, where it is a, a, a for, for a number of reasons. As I said, it is more of a microcosm of community that you have the entire community. You have folks that are entering the job market and folks that are special needs, but also in the building, look, that there are communities, whether you're in the South Bronx or Southeast Queens, that we have working, living professionals within those communities yep. that yep. don't want to leave and are willing to, to live with other folks yep. that should be able to share their experiences, mentor those experiences. Because what I see, by not doing that, then we become, we ultimately become NYCHA, right? Where, how do you pay for this? And we get to the point that we are now, we find ourselves in a situation that deteriorating housing, no additional funds, and and that model, which was uh, working family based, and uh, has become something totally different. It has become where we put all of either the working poor or just the poor folks, and nowhere to pay for it. Right. So it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy if we continue to do what we have been doing and expecting different results. So I, I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, next panel, Mohammed uh, from Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, okay, Jenny Hernandez. Jenny Hernandez. Gardner Soto. Pedro Camboa. And Kirsten Ford. Oh, and Dr. Parrott. Thank you, sir. Yes. Oh, man. Really stacking, really stacking. We, we generally start at the end, so that's Dr. Foy or Dr. Parrott. Yeah. <clears throat> Be happy to start. James Parrott, um, Director of uh, Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Chairman Miller, um, for having this hearing and the opportunity to testify <clears throat> on intro 1321A, a measure to expand prevailing wage to building services for large city-supported affordable housing developments. According to the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, the NYC.gov poverty threshold for 2017 was $33,562 for two adult, two child family. For a full time worker, wages below $16.14 an hour in 2017 would put their family below the poverty line. We've heard that. Uh, the city's uh, HDC currently uses a non-prevailing wage underwriting standard of $44,165 per year for janitors and porters. That amount includes wages, benefits, and payroll taxes. Uh, using ratios from the, uh, from the BLS uh, employee compensation survey at the national level, that would work out to 75% for wages, 25% for everything else. That would mean that the HDC standard uh, roughly equals $15.92 an hour with $5.31 per hour for benefits and payroll taxes. As noted earlier, $15.92 would be below the hourly NYC.gov poverty line for a four-person family. Benefits totaling $5.31 would provide for little more than the mayor's proposed 10 days of paid leave $3,100 for health insurance, and an employer retirement contribution of a paltry 1.7%. In contrast, the prevailing wage level for residential building cleaners and porters, or uh, door persons, provides for an hourly wage of $24.90 and hourly benefits of $12.81. These prevailing wage standards represent an annual wage of nearly $51,800 and benefits that provide for family health insurance, paid vacation, as well as holidays, 
and a decent amount toward retirement savings. The prevailing wage standard comes a lot closer to supporting the middle class standard in New York City than the poverty wage and benefit levels currently used by HDC. This comes at a cost, but a manageable one, raising workers from the poverty wages currently suggested by HDC to prevailing wages would increase development costs by an estimated 1.7%. And we need to keep in mind that poverty wages also come at a cost, both personal and for society at large. Poverty pay displaces cost onto taxpayers in the form of public assistance and additional budget costs associated with helping poverty-stricken families cope with inadequate earnings from work. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Gardner Soto. I have been a member of 32BJ for four years. Having a, a paying prevailing wage changed my life. I have worked at a mixed use building in downtown Brooklyn since it opened. The complex includes a mall, two residential towers, one luxury and one my, minority affordable. The affordable tower receives a package of significant tax breaks. The financing from the city, which would have required the owners to pay my co-workers and me the prevailing wage, has buildings not been majority affordable. In 2016, before my co-workers and I organized I, and won the union, we made barely enough to survive. We were struggling to make rent, buy food, our families purchase, purchasing Metro cards and paying for other necessities like phones and electrical bills. After organizing the union, my coworkers and I started to earn prevailing wages. I no longer worry about putting food on the table and could finally save and no longer live check by check. My co-workers and my family live, lives become less stressful and burden of surviving in the city has been lifted. Today you have the opportunity to change this reality for building service workers like me who work in affordable housing that receive city subsidies. No working, no workers or families should be forced to earn poverty wages because they work in an affordable housing. I urge you to vote yes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Pedro Gamboa, and I have been a member of 32BJ for three years. As an airport worker, I know firsthand how important it is to be paid a standard like prevailing wage. I am here to testify in solidarity with building services workers in affordable housing and urge you to pass this bill. In 2010, I started to work at JFK as a baggage handler. For years, my co-workers and I have been fighting to create a better wage, a standard that includes significant benefits like health insurance. In September of last year, we won the legislation, and we are on our way to make $19 an hour. However, we are still fighting for other benefits, and we won't stop. At 63 years old, I have worked hard to provide a good life for my family, and earning the minimum wage is not enough to survive in the city. No workers should have to decide whether they eat, lunch, or pay for electric bill. Like in this airport, government plays significant role in uplifting workers and affordable housing. Today, you have an opportunity to give us, to give workers who make a little as minimum wage an opportunity 
for upward mobility by ending this prevailing wage curve out. I am proud to be here today in solidarity with my 32 BJ brothers and sisters. Today is about doing the right thing for workers and families in New York City, and I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller and the members of the Committee on Civil Service and the Labor for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mohammed Tipu Sultan. I represent the Taxi Worker Alliance. We are fighting to raise the standards for the driver across the New York State. We are also, also proud to stand side by side with the low wage workers and other workers fighting for the standard in the city. We, we, we see this bill as a part of the movement to improve the life of the working families in New York City. The council has thought, uh, fought to raise the driver standard and in turn has changed the lives of so many hardworking drivers. We still more battle in the fight for good job for the drivers and we are ready to fight alongside our brother and sister affordable housing development. Prevailing wage standard are the path up the, to the middle class, especially for the thousands of black and brown building service workers in our city publicly financed project, and certainly those receiving $1 million or more should pay this prevailing wage. Why would we understand, undermine the good job with the public money? Why would the city of New York want to create poverty job? Poverty job have no place in the greatest city of New York City in the world. We know that good job help our community. Good job also help taxi and for higher vehicle driver since we are all part of the service economy and fighting for the standard. As wage go up, Spending goes up, and this is good for our economy and working people. The city and the city council have been on the front line of the fighting for the drivers, and TWA stand strongly on the front line with 32BJ, SEIU, and the building service worker who need good job standard. I strongly urge you to pass intro 1321. Thank you. Thank you, Co Council Member Miller and, and members of the committee um, for this opportunity to present testimony on intro 1321. My name is Carla Walter. I direct the American Worker Project at the Center for American Progress Action Fund. I've conducted extensive research on how cities, states, and the federal government are using government spending to uphold higher standards in their communities. Uh, cities and states across the country have adopted wage standards to ensure that workers whose jobs are funded by the government uh, are paid decent wages and receive good benefits. Progressive communities are increasingly attaching these standards to development sub subsidies, and New York became a national leader when the city council enacted the Service Worker Prevailing Wage Ordinance in 2012 that extended prevailing wage protections to recipients of economic development subsidies and companies leasing commercial and office space from the city or to the city. Yet by not extending these protections to affordable housing developers, the ordinance did not go far enough. Intro 1321 would help ensure that building service workers on city subsidized housing projects are paid market wages. Closing the loophole is increasingly important given the priority that Mayor de Blasio has placed on expanding development and preservation of affordable housing in the city. Um, moreover, the bill would directly impact thousands of workers whose uh, at projects built or preserved under the Housing New York plan. Um, while the, the legislation would help establish New York as a leader, other governments have adopted similar standards. For example, the federal government requires that maintenance workers on federally supported public housing are paid prevailing wages. And Philadelphia is moving in the direction of requiring residential and commercial developments that receive subsidies to pay building services workers at least the prevailing wage. Expanding the reach of building service prevailing wage is not only good for workers, but also for high road developers. Without strong standards, too often companies that pay market wages are forced to compete against low road companies. 
For example, after Maryland implemented a wage standard, it, they found that they encouraged more ro high road companies to do business with the government. Moreover, a review of state and local pra government practices found that the adoption of wage standards resulted in decreased employee turnover and savings in restaffing costs. So for example, after the San Francisco airport adopted a wage standard, uh, annual turnover among security screeners fell from nearly 95% to 19%. Turnover reductions also help increase the experience and skill level of the workforce. And by raising workplace standards, governments can ensure that taxpayers receive good value. When workers are poorly compensated, taxpayers often bear hidden costs, such as provision of subsidized health insurance, housing, and nutrition assistance. Opponents often claim that these industry standards would hurt the economy by raising costs and preventing development. However, the city could cover the added cost of ensuring developers pay market wages by raising financial assistance levels at a marginal amount relative to total development costs. Also, research finds that the costs of wage standards can be offset by a more highly skilled, more productive workforce, and as a result leads to improvements in the quality of service provided to affordable housing residents. Finally, industry wage standards provide significant benefits to state and local economies. For example, one study estimated that California's prevailing wage boost law boosted economic output by $1.4 billion per year. Cities and states are using these prevailing wage laws to ensure that government spending doesn't drive down standards. Closing the loopholes in the affordable housing with the affordable housing would establish New York City as a leader. This concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, Miller, for your uh, holding of this hearing and your leadership on so many critical issues to the city. I've come to uh, lend my voice in, in support of 1321. Um, I have a whole thing here, but I'm going to skip a lot of it. A lot of the, the points that I wanted to make were made, but I would like to make two points. I think what we are dealing with here are the juxtaposition of our principled belief in supporting good jobs and the practicality of building affordable housing. I think that is a false dichotomy and a false choice. I think we need to, as the most progressive city in the world, we need to create a, um, uh, a labor environment that is equitable, that is, um, that is fair to all workers, and that sets a standard um, nationally. We cannot allow there to be structural inadequacy or structural inequities um, in, our, in our workforce. We cannot allow the, um, the practical necessities of certain industries to justify discrimination against certain workers. If that were the case, then we could justify the, pay par the, 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 the lack of pay parity between men and women. We could, businesses could say, I can't afford to pay women what I pay men, because if I do that, that's going to affect my bottom line. So this, to me, is, um, is, is, a, is a ridiculous argument. What we need to do is take our eyes off of the pennies and put the eyes on the dollars. Uh, affordable housing is not just about the availability of the stock, it's also about the buying power. It's about the community's ability to consume the product. And we cannot have a country and an economy where wages have remained flat for two decades and then have structural inadequacies here in the city and then say, well, we, we need to really focus on just this issue of affordable housing without dealing with the issue of uh, economic justice and, and, and uh, income inequality. So this for me is really about uh, uh, driving home the point that we, we must be a leader in creating uh, uh, an equitable economy that is based on treating each and every worker the same, not allowing for there to be structural um, uh, segregation economic segregation. You work over here in this community servicing this population, so therefore we can only pay you this amount of money. Uh, I, this is 2019. The fact that we have to have a, 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 a debate around whether or not all workers who do the same work should be paid the same amount of money is really uh, is a ridiculous argument. But I, I have come to support 
not just the workers of 32BJ, but also the other workers who are, uh, uh, who are victimized by structural inadequacies and structural inequities, um, pay inequities and income inequities, and we must reverse that, and 1321 uh, is a step in that direction. Thank you, sir. We, we, we do this, right? And, and so, I, and I will submit that this panel, we have gotten down to the meat and potatoes, right, of, of what this is about. And, and the question that I would ask is whether or not others, the, uh, the, the previous panel in particular, whether or not they were oversimplifying the issue of how do we provide um, affordable housing? And, and were they not taking into considerations what was just articulated by Dr. Parrott and, and other members, and, and quite frankly, what I said myself and what we have in my district, the varying, uh, 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 the different types of, of, of affordable housing that, that addresses holistically uh, the needs of the community. And, um, it, Is, a, is, 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 is what I'm hearing now is how we quantify holistically what affordable housing means to a, a community in terms of jobs, economic development, housing, and, and, and the full package, or was it just oversimplified as, as it was previously uh, expressed? I'd be happy to, to, to start on that. Um, it is sort of an unusual argument, um, but not, not unusual in the sense that uh, I've seen a lot in, in, um, over the years, nonprofit organizations that rely heavily upon the city for contracts or subsidies and so on, being reluctant to be a firm advocate on behalf of broad positions, which all of us, uh, particularly the council, have supported for many years of lifting up everyone in New York City to address these structural inequities and, and, and inequalities that exist. We've made incredible progress in recent years. This is the first economic expansion uh, since the 1950s in New York that hasn't been primarily driven by Wall Street. And a lot of that is due to the increase in the minimum wage floor in New York City and the support that the council and the mayor have given to raising the wages of low-paid low um, workers in New York City, including nonprofit sector workers. The city, right off the bat, as soon as the governor announced the increase to $15, said New York City is going to pay for, you know, to lift all of the workers in the nonprofit sector up to the $15 uh, level. And as uh, was discussed earlier, this council, uh, in its budget agreement with, with the city, fought for and secured uh, you know, Im impressive progress in addressing salary disparity issues that exist. Here's another instance where we need to close this loophole, uh, apply prevailing wage standards uh, across the board to city subsidized uh, efforts. And it would be, um, now, you could see that as an unfunded mandate, although, uh, you know, as was pointed out, if it's a funded mandate and the city is contributing the resources uh, to close the financing gap, uh, we would certainly uh, all be better off. And uh, it would be better, I think, if the nonprofit affordable housing sector was making that argument, the affirmative argument that we need to raise wages uh, and the city needs to fund that. Um, and just that, that covers basically all of my bases, except for I just say that what, one of the other things that research shows is that prevailing wage standards are a boon both to the broader economy, we are a consumer-driven economy, but also that some of the cost is mitigated because you get a workforce that there's less turnover, because you get a workforce that is invested in with training. And so you start to see positive benefits that also flow to developers. And I would just add really quickly, I think the point that you made earlier is, is a critical point. Um, we, what we're suggesting here is that it's okay for workers to rely on other public subsidies. It's okay for workers to have to go out and rely on food stamps. It's okay for workers to have to, to lean on society as a whole to subsidize low wages, but 
we shouldn't really be focused on how we will uh, eliminate structural inequities so that they can raise their income and then become self-sustaining individuals, self-sustaining families, and self-sustaining communities. I just want to add it as a uh, organizer from the taxi driver union. As you're seeing that nine drivers suicide because of the economic hardship is in, this is the, the great city in the world. And uh, this year, very beginning, it, it was little lift, especially in the app-based sector. The taxi worker alliances have fight a lot to lift this little, uh, little up. And it's still we are fighting, and it's fight, continue fighting with this Wall Street funded company who was paying pay cut, and this driver was barely surviving. When the wage goes up, it is really healthy, the whole community. Uh, it is really healthy for the family, for the children, and that is the we are looking for actually. And uh, this, the workers should be the priority, and every worker should be the similarly treated with the with the wage. So the intro thirteen twenty one, uh, and it's a great thing to be uh, help this uh, workers uh, to be go up and with the healthy life. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for your testimony. I also look forward to working with you um, as we drill down on this legislation and, and other legislation, certainly, um, that we heard today. And, and I'm, I'm sure that a few of you will be back next week to testify on an our pay equity hearing as well. And so, uh, again, thank you and look forward to working with you in the future. Next panel, Claire Sheedy, Dina Davis, Laura Mashoush. Uh, do we have two Dina Davises or do we just have? Oh, okay. <laughs> Michelle Jackson and Eric Lee. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, please um, hold the mic close, uh, push the red button, and identify yourself before your testimony. Okay. And it's a hard clock, ladies. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee um, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Laura Mishu. I'm the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. Um, we have greatly appreciated the opportunity for dialogue with the council um, around 1321A since it was introduced in January and are glad that the amended version um, includes a carve out for supportive housing as defined by the supportive housing loan program, but wanted to talk further about the other programs that include supportive housing and also the need for a further exemption to an average uh, unit of 80% AMI. As you know, supportive housing is deeply affordable housing serving formerly homeless people with disabling conditions, as well as low-income me low members of the community. While the typical supportive housing model is financed through the supportive housing loan program, it is comprised of 60% supportive and 40% low-income. We are now seeing other types of mixed models um, through the Ella and Sarah programs that are using to create residences where 30% of the units are supportive. Um, and in fact, for both low income and seniors, and so that 42% of supportive housing residences are now being created through Ella and Sarah, in addition to the supportive housing loan program. So while we appreciate the amendment protects the 60% model, we would like for these other models to be taken into consideration. 
Um, we are here today and joined by our colleagues also increasing the exemption in the bill for nonprofit operated human service programs and all residential projects that are committed by a regulatory agreement to households earning 80% AMI on average. Additionally, affordable housing preservation projects must be protected. While we completely understand the need for increasing wages and fringe benefits is a laudable goal, the impact is significant on affordable housing budgets and without the corresponding subsidy to make the projects work, it would result in the reduction in the number of units created and preserved. As an example, um, within the senior program, 800 additional units um, is um, added to, through the fiscal years 2020 to 2023. That brings a total senior housing plan to 4,800. If passed into law as written, 1321A carries an additional average cost of $9,300 per unit for an upfront capital for the newly expanded senior housing plan, and that's $44 million in additional money that would need to be found. There's two other issues I just want to highlight. Um, preservation projects, which I think the city has talked about, is a large concern. There's a real effort to save existing affordable housing with expiring regulatory agreements. They're currently included in this bill, and they would be subject to prevailing wage, which might then have the owner decide to not keep them affordable and convert them to market rate. And the second one is in the new reiteration, the bill pertains to any city development project undertaken by the city or an economic development entity, and it seems to be now pointing toward uh, the possibility that applies to other nonprofit operated programs, such as temporary shelters, senior centers, daycare centers, et cetera. And in this realm, it would be a completely unfunded mandate uh, to bring prevailing wages to those environments. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Human Services Council. We represent about 170 human services providers in New York. Thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to testify and for sticking with us till the afternoon. Um, I'm unfortunately testifying in opposition to intro 1321A. Um, HSC and our members support efforts to lift the wages of workers across New York City because it means a better community for everyone and means less people coming through our doors for a myriad of services. Unfortunately, um, because of this bill um, and the way that the city tends to fund or not fund human services programs, I'm being forced to participate in what we call the human services hunger games, where we have to talk about limited resources and when we lift up one workforce without lifting another, what that means for our sector. So um, my testimony is much more extensive, but to be perfectly blunt, the reason we oppose this is for two reasons. The city doesn't pay its bills <laughs> to human services, uh, and the city doesn't pay human services workers enough. Uh, on average, and James Parrott testified before about the city did fund the minimum wage increase on human services contracts, there isn't a prevailing wage in the human services sector. We have what's called a living wage, which was, is $16 and change. The average human services worker in New York City makes $29,000. That's $4,000 less than the income needed to be above the poverty line. 60% of our workforce qualify for public assistance programs. So we need to lift all boats together, and that means increasing the human services workforce salary when we talk about prevailing wage. And so the problem with this bill is that there isn't, uh, there isn't a way to talk about parity between different um, workers as SUS testified earlier, I think that's an important component is how do we pay one of our workers who's a maintenance worker or any position $58,000 or $80,000 when we have other workers who are at the poverty line. And this bill doesn't address kind of the comprehensive workforce, so we'd like to put a pause on this bill and talk more uh, holistically about how to lift up all of these workers. Because when you create those wage disparities, it's either an unfunded mandate for the workforce, for nonprofits mm -hmm. to figure out how to pay everyone the appropriate parity, or um, you can't do it, and you either pay some workers more than others, and you have re recruitment and retention issues. The second thing is that there isn't a funding mechanism to even pay the salaries, the prevailing wage salaries in this bill, and historically, whether it's compression on the minimum wage, paid sick leave, paid family leave, um, exempt employee overtime, the city has not paid those increases, which has exacerbated the funding gap that nonprofits have, leading to an insolvency rate of about 20% of New York human service providers um, who provide critical services in the city. So we do tentatively support the carve out that has been mentioned by our colleagues. The reason we say tentatively is because as spoken earlier by, um, by the council, having nonprofits exempted from this just means 
we lose a qualified workforce and um, we lose out, um, to, we either have to pay the prevailing wage or we don't have the workforce necessary to do this um, work. And so instead we'd like to pause this legislation and work with our partners in the city council to talk about how we really can lift all boats together and not leave human services providers sinking while we raise up other boats. I think that's a more important conversation um, that needs to be had before we could support a piece of legislation like this. So thank you. My name is Dina Davis, and um, I represent the Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, also known as WishFish. I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. WishFish is a not-for-profit organization with over 40 years of experience. By 2020, we will be managing nearly 20, 2,400 units of housing for older adults. I, I don't want to, um, my written testimony is is longer, but I just want to point to a couple of things that I think need to be understood about our concerns about this legislation. The parameters of the affordable exemption are too limited. Um, many developments serve a large percentage of a vulnerable populations remain subject to this bill, including exclusively senior housing that we build, and projects which have a smaller percentage of supportive units. And th that's been touched on before by other uh, speakers. Um, and then we, we think that the expand, we should expand the affordability exemption to include any development subject to a regulatory agreement in which the average household income being served is, is at 80% of AMI. Um, we are concerned about the preservation challenges of this um, uh, because uh, it could be imposed when you're refinancing a project, when you're up for a, um, the renewal of your tax abatement, and um, that it, that just simply doesn't work on our tight budgets. The point's also been made that we get funding for so many of our, our services are paid for by other contracts, so, social service agencies, and supportive housing agencies, we don't just fund for our building workers, we fund social workers, we fund personal care aides, and this issue of parity and equity within a nonprofit organization pay structure is a very important concern. The final thing I wanna say is that non-for-profit developers care about permanently affordable housing, and that we think that the non-profit exemption is, is extremely important, and that we think that that should be back in the legislation. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you to Chair Miller and members of the committee for uh, allowing me to testify today on um, 1321A. My name's Claire Sheedy, and I'm the Vice President of Housing Operations and Programs at Breaking Ground. Breaking Ground is a New York City-based nonprofit whose mission is to strengthen individuals, families, and communities by developing and sustaining exceptional, supportive, and affordable housing, as well as programs for homeless and other vulnerable New Yorkers. We've been around for about 30 years. Um, using innovative financing and historic restoration, we write, revitalize buildings and neighborhoods. Each year, we work to increase the supply of affordable housing for those with the greatest economic need. We operate more than 3,700 units of housing with over 1,000 more in development. We're here today to join our colleagues in requesting an exemption in the bill for all nonprofit operated human services programs and residential projects that are committed by regulatory agreement to rent to low income households. In other words, households earning 80% AMI on average. We appreciate the amendment um, that was made to exempt some supportive housing projects and the willingness to engage in dialogue thus far, but in order to protect housing and services for New Yorkers who need it most, additional amendments are required. Intro 1321A will impose additional costs on our supportive and affordable housing development projects without providing any new resources to make those costs feasible. While this version of the bill does exempt certain supportive housing projects from the prevailing wage requirement for building services workers, the exemption fails to protect city-financed residences that house low-income senior citizens and low-income and formerly homeless New Yorkers. For example, Breaking Ground is in the process of developing a senior housing residence in the Bronx with 152 apartments through HPD's Senior Affordable Rental Apartments, or SARA, program. 
47 of these apartments will be rented to seniors who are homeless, and 105 will be for low-income seniors. There will be a supportive housing contract to fund rental assistance and social services for the 30% of tenants who are formerly homeless. However, all seniors in the building will be welcome to access the social services provided, and our experience suggests that many will. As we're drafting the development budget and the ongoing maintenance and operations budget for the property, we take great care in ensuring that our income and expenses are balanced. All of the property's operating costs must be covered by the property's rental income. Our rental income is limited to the low-income rents paid by tenants and by rental assistance contracts. If intro 1321A is passed into law as currently written, the property's operating expenses will increase substantially. As we cannot and would not wish to increase tenant rents, and we cannot obtain additional rental assistance, we would have no additional income to cover this cost and would need to cut expenses elsewhere. Our only solution would be to reduce the mortgage loan amount so that we would be able to reduce the expense of our monthly mortgage payment. Taking out a smaller mortgage, however, would leave us without enough funding to construct our building. The only solution would be to request more capital subsidy from the city or state. In the case of the 152 unit, uh, residents, senior residents in the Bronx, compliance with 1321A would translate to $6 million in additional capital subsidy. And we know that $6 million more spent on our project could mean 80 fewer affordable units for seniors elsewhere. In order to protect affordable housing for low-income senior and formerly homeless New Yorkers, as well as nonprofits' fiscal health, a carve-out in the bill for all nonprofit operated human services programs and residential projects that are committed by regulatory agreement to rent to low-income house households earning 80 percent AMI on average is necessary. Thank you again for the opportunity. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you, Chairperson Miller and the committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Eric Lee, and I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Uh, HSU is a coalition of 50 different nonprofit homeless service providers in New York City, and we represent the majority of nonprofit shelter beds in New York City for both families and singles. I'll uh, cover just the highlights of my testimony given the time uh, provided. Uh, HSU ap applauds the council for the intent to increase wages for New Yorkers, but this bill as currently written would have seriously dire consequences for nonprofit homeless service providers in New York City. Our nonprofit members suffer from chronically late DHS payments for city contracts, with some agencies taking out multi-million dollar loans to cover delays for operating and payroll expense. DHS model budget implementation, which some agencies are still waiting for two years later now, has, has been exercising futility, with OMB denying salary raises for case managers, capping fringe rates at 26%, and primarily focusing on increasing security and maintenance lines. Intro 1321A would essentially require nonprofits to cannibalize social service dollars to further invest in recently increased building services fees at the expense of quality social services that were never fully funded in the first place. If passed, this bill would make it impossible for nonprofits to develop and operate purpose-built shelter, further prolonging DHS's reliance on hotels, clusters, and other inferior models, and or further cannibalize social service dollars in the effort to somehow cope with this unfunded mandate. Uh, Chairperson Miller, to your earlier uh, concern regarding income inequality, this, to fund this bill, DHS shelters would effectively have to fire or cut wages of women who compromise 70% of our social services staff in order to give raises to predominantly male security and maintenance positions in our programs. Uh, because there is a DHS not to exceed contract amount, Shelter staff uh, budget lines like on site medical and psych psychiatric services, child care workers, employment, and aftercare specialists have already been cut in order to meet new security requirements and agency savings goals. Mandating a prevailing wage would cut the only thing that is left staff lines like caseworkers, social workers, and housing specialists to the bone. Program budgets would be further disrupted by having to maintain two different fringe rates across their portfolios, and wage ladders would also be disrupted, increasing wages for supervisees above those of their supervisors. Given these reasons, HSU encourages the committee to exclude nonprofit-operated human service programs as well as residential programs that rent to households earning 80% AMI on average. 
In closing, HSU would like to thank you, Chairperson Miller, as well as the committee and the members of the council for your continued leadership and dedication to supporting New York's workforce. And while we object to the passage of the bill as drafted, we would welcome the opportunity to work with you on developing sector-wide human services procurement and rate reform for our entire staff. Thank you. So um, I, I do have, before the comment, that I have a few comments and, and perhaps a, a question uh, before the panel leaves. And I do want to take instruct folks that we're going to be taking a five-minute break. We've been here since 10 o'clock, and some housekeeping things have to get done. So um, there was, in some of the testimony, we talked about Ella and some of the other program, mandated programs that occur over there. And so while our goal is, our overall goal is to make sure that we're providing affordable housing holistically throughout, but particularly focusing on the most vulnerable. If in fact now council legislation, uh, which has not passed us yet, but term sheets that are written now with, with uh, uh, in compliance with affordable housing uh, subsidies, uh, have mandates, right? They have these 20 and, and 30 percent mandates. Um, that's certainly addressing the market if, in fact, you're looking at um, larger numbers of three and 400 units that are that are that are going up throughout the city. So that is one thing that has to be, I, I believe, should be taken into consideration that that they're addressing that that um, in many many places um, it just would not happen. Um, that we would not see the 20 and 30 percent of homeless uh, population and other population that are being mandated within these affordable uh, subsidized units w would not occur. And, and so I, I think that certainly is something that we have to consider when we look at the numbers of our, our, our target universe. Mm -hmm. um, the, for, for, for the human services industry folk, I, 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 I hope that you guys have signed up to testify uh, at next week's hearing on pay equity um, because what I'm hearing I find super disturbing. I find it super disturbing that, that most of these folks that are employed, that are providing critical services are in some need of financial subsidies from government agencies themselves based on their compensation they are qualifying. The answer is not the race to the bottom. The answer is to lift up everyone and it has to start somewhere that we have to create a standard and a balance and um, honestly what we are witnessing here today is, is really the standards and the virtues of organized labor, the right to organize and the right to collective bargaining. And that's where the standards for workers kind of happen. And so what we're looking at in that industry are unorganized folks who don't necessarily get to bargain for themselves and so it was left to the council to be their advocates on their behalf and, and say that a living wage is, and we know that a living wage is just not what it takes, right? And the fact of the matter is, when we talk about pay equity, we, we, we're, we're talking about these professionals that are providing these critical, critical services to our most vulnerable. These folks are still paying student loans and living on, not even $20 an hour, like how is that possible? That is the conversation that we should be having and not, you know, that, that is absolutely the conversation that I hope that you will join us um, next week on the 20th when we will have our hearing on pay equity, that it is certainly a space for your voice in doing so and, and that is I think how we holistically uh, address these needs and, and some of the other things. But as we move further in this conversation, certainly your voice is, is going to be needed again um, as we kind of get closer to what this legislation will, will, will look like. Mm 
what carve out carve outs or not carve outs or whether or not we are maximizing all of our experiences and resources in, in doing so. But I, I again I, I I welcome your testimony, but I, I also look forward to working with you in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this is gonna be a five minute housekeeping. So thank you.
Thank you so much uh, for accommodating us. And uh, so we're going to now call the next panel. Rose Fernandez. Jessica Ortiz. Jenny Hernandez. Uh, I know we called yeah, her before. Switched around. Okay, okay. Major Childs. David Collier. Fidelia. Merkulik. Mr. Mer I don't know. Merkulik. Merkulik. So, we've got a hard three-minute clock. I ask you to adhere to it. Um, we're going to start from the ends, pull the mic close, and push the red button. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Fadila Markolik. In 1973, I came to this country in the hope for a better life for my family. One year later, I got a job cleaning office building in Manhattan. This job was good, union job, and, to, and for the uh, last 45 years, I have been proud member of 32BJ. Raising four children on my own in New York City wasn't easy. However, having a job that pays the prevailing wage give me peace of mind and allow me to give my children life with dignity. Often I hear stories from single mothers who go to the bed praying that they will have a enough money to feed their children lunch next day. I am lucky to be able to go to the bed th thanking God for my job that allow me to avoid homelessness and be able to put food on a table without worry. Two years ago, I won housing Laro for newly, newly created affordable housing. As a part of MIH, because of this, I have been able to continue to live in my, in my increasingly expensive neighborhood, Astoria. However, as I approach retirement, I don't know if I could afford this apartment without my prevailing wage, wage job and the retirement benefits that I will receive because of it. Throughout my time being an active member of 32BJ, I have been able to engage in the city politics and democratic pro process, such as this hearing today. One reason I am so proud of being 32BJ member is because we don't fight just for ourselves. We fight for all the working people. One day I will retire from my job cleaning, but I will never retire, I'm never going to retire from fighting so that all working uh, people, all working people could live with dignity and earn prevailing wages. I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rose Fernandez, and I'm a member leader of Community Voices Heard. I've lived in East Harlem or El Barrio for over 30 years and I have lived in both private and public housing. Community Voices Heard, or CVH, is a member-led, multiracial organization. Most of our members are women of color and low-income families. We have a large chapter here in New York City 
and chapters in Yonkers, Newburgh, and Poughkeepsie. We tackle tough issues and build power to secure racial, social, and economic justice for all New Yorkers. Most of our New York City members live in either NYCHA or rent stabilized housing, and some people have won lottery slots to live in affordable housing created through one of the city programs or live in buildings that the city renovated in the 1980s and 1990s through various programs. At CVH, we look at how employment, housing, education, and other areas intersect. For example, when it comes to public housing, we value the fact that workers get union salaries and benefits. Many of these same workers are our family members and neighbors, and they spend a significant amount of their paychecks in the same community. We believe firmly that any time the City of New York is making investments in housing or other infrastructure, that it is part of the city's responsibility or mission, really, to make sure that workers get paid well, receive decent benefits, and have the right to organize. Otherwise, what, have, what are we as a city doing? It means workers doing the construction and then workers hired afterwards to maintain those city investments. The city cannot thrive if working people cannot afford to live here. The city itself is one of the biggest drivers of the economy and should simply have a more, if not legal, responsibility to ensure pay prevailing wage on projects that the city makes possible. Ensuring that maintenance jobs created through New York's affordable housing programs are paid prevailing wages will not only strengthen the economy, but it's also just common sense and decency. The city's affordable housing programs have created thousands of well-paid jobs for developers and management companies, for bankers, for real estate lawyers, for tax accountants, and for insurance bank brokers. So why is it always the maintenance jobs that come up short when it comes to good pay and benefits? The racial and class implications are clear and are unacceptable. It is time for the leadership of the city to put an end to this and make sure the prevailing wage is an essential element of the city's affordable housing programs. I want to thank you, Council, for this time and for listening to my testimony and unfortunately, I have to run. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Jessica Ortiz, and I have been a member of 32BJ for six years. My entire life, I have worked multiple jobs to provide a life of dignity for my children. Working all the time and raising young kids was tough. I missed important moments in my children's lives. I was forced to choose between putting food on the table or spending time with my kids. Despite working multiple jobs, I still could not afford to pay my bills and provide for my family. Having grown up on public assistance, I vowed to do whatever I could to, sh to make sure my children didn't grow up in poverty. Unfortunately, three jobs wasn't enough to survive, and I swallowed my pride and filed for public assistance. For three years, I got help from the government with food stamps and Medicaid. In 2013, I was called to be a temporary cleaner at Trinity School on the Upper West Side. Little did I know that this job was going to pay me the prevailing wage and would change my family's life forever. When I became a permanent worker, I was able to quit my other jobs and get off Medicaid and public assistance. Most importantly, I got to spend time with my children. Property service workers in affordable housing deserve to have family-sustaining jobs that allow them to provide a life with dignity for their families. Today, you have the opportunity to provide working families in New York with livable wages. I urge you to vote yes on this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and member to the committee. My name is Jenny Hernandez. I have been a member of 32BJ for 14 years. Having a prevailing wage job has changed my life. I come to this country in 1996 from the Dominican Republic in hope of a better life. However, like many immigrants, my path to establish, establish, my path 
to stability and security was not easy. After a year of struggling to survive in New York City, including having to sleep in the subway, I had no choice but to send my son, six months old, back to my country with my family. While I stayed here and struggled to establish a life, I found a minimum wage job with house health care, but this was not enough for me to bring my son back. For five years, I lived in New York without him missing the first step and the other important moments in the first years of life. This is the cost of working at minimum wage. Taxpayers' money should never fund jobs like this. In 2006, 10 years after struggling to survive in this country, I got a prevailing wage job as a cleaner in commercial building in Midtown. That's when my life changed. My good paying job with benefit gave me the security I need to bring my son in this country. A few years ago, my son needed surgery, and I did not have to pay for anything or had to take unpaid time off from work. All working families like mine deserve this kind of life, a life without worrying about surviving or making a meet. Workers who work in affordable housing deserve to live with dignity and security. This project should lift people up, not be part of writing stories like mine. Today, you have an opportunity to change the life of service workers in affordable housing. I urge you to approve this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Major Childs. I am here. I am here today as a five-year member of 32BJ, a native New Yorker, as a, as a father of three wonderful young adults, raising, um, for, uh, raising three children in New York City has not been easy. Prior to getting this job as a cleaner in, in, a, in a school, I struggled to provide a life with dignity and security for my family. Now that I have a job that pays the prevailing wage. A weight has been lifted off my um, shoulders, and we live with pe with a peace of mind. The prevailing wage comes with significant ch um, significance and a life changing benefits like sick pay, leave, and health care. Currently, I am out of work on disability due to an injury. I have comfort in knowing that I have job protection and security as well as um, health benefits. These are benefits that all um, working people should have access to and I am respectfully urging you to pass this bill. Thank you. Hello. Good, mo good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for prioritizing the needs of workers. My name is David Collier. I've been a member of 32BJ for five years. I work at Hudson Yards as security officer and I live in Harlem. Before making the prevailing wage, I, I worked security slash doorman slash concierge in an apartment building that had affordable units. And I struggled with health care, rent, and other bills. I also struggled with the respect, the respect that a union gives you to be proud to do your job. 
Um, after I paid the rent, there wasn't much left for, wasn't much left over. My prevailing wage, benefit, wage and benefits makes life a little easier now that I'm in the union and I'm getting the prevailing wage. As I get older, I, I need to go to see the doctor and now I can. Um, but even with the little extra money I get, uh, or I, I, I'm getting now, it's good to feel, it feels good to be able to support my community. You know, every once in a while I go out and I'll buy me a new hat or, you know, maybe I could go out for dinner. And um, it's important for building service workers in affordable housing developments to make the prevailing wage because right now they're struggling. Making lower wage makes it harder for them to do their jobs. I hope this city council passes this bill. Thank you to the panel for your testimony. It, it is important that your voice get heard. I want to thank everyone for staying around, and I know that wasn't easy either, so thank you. <clears throat> Next panel, Roger Moore. Vi, Vi May Richardson White. Jordan Weiss, Regina Thompson, Jonathan Hogstick, and El Padilla Molina. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. My name is Roger Moore, and I have been a proud member of the 32BJ for three years. In 1999, my family that was living in the United States petitioned for a visa so that, I could, so that my wife, daughter, and I could come to this country. 10 years later, we received permission to come to the United States in hope for a better life. In 2011, one year after arriving in the US, I got a job as a porter at a new residential building in Harlem, making $11 an hour without benefits. I worked two jobs to support my wife and daughter, struggling to pay rent and put food on the table. My hope coming to this country was that I would be able to provide my family a good life with dignity. When I started out as a, as a residential building service worker, I was earning minimum wage with no benefits. Then my coworkers and I learned that our building was prevailing wage required and that we were experiencing wage theft. We organized to get the wages and benefits we were owed and we won. My pay jumped from minimum wage with no benefits to a livable wage that included health and other significant benefits. I was finally able to provide my family the life we believed we could have in America and send money home to my son and granddaughter that remained in Trinidad. Having a job that pays the prevailing wage did not just change my life, it changed my entire family situation. My family and I live in low-income housing in Brooklyn. I see myself in the workers who maintain and clean my building. No family should have to go through what my family went through in order to survive. Today, the New York City Council has an opportunity 
to affect the lives of many working families in New York City. The minimum wage is not a livable wage, and people who work in affordable housing should not have to live in poverty. The decision you make today may even affect those we have left behind. In order to pursue a better life in the United States, I hope you hear our stories today and vote yes. I thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and, and members of the committee. My name is Vi Mae Richardson White, and I have been a 32 G BJ member for over 30 years. I raised my children in low-income housing, and I know the firsthand and the importance. The importance is, is for these um, sorry projects to prevail families, substantial job, jobs. We need we need people who clean and man, and maintain our developments to come to work every day, ready to perform their best instead of having to worry about how they will make ends meet. To me, a prevailing job means that I can pay my rent without worry. A prevailing wage job took me out of poverty. Before I had a prevailing wage job, I was on public assistance, trying to survive day to day. I didn't even have a bank account. The first time I I was able to take my children on, vac on a proper vacation was after I got a job that paid the prevailing wage. That first vacation was the moment I realized how life different changed a job that, often, that offered a prevailing wage is. I can relax with my children and enjoy a paid day off without worry. As, as I am approaching retirement, I attest at, I'm sorry, I can attest to how important the prevailing wage is at all stage of life. The benefits like health care and retirement mean I will be able to continue to live in New York without worry. Workers in affordable housing like where I live desire their benefits too. No working family in New York should be subject to poverty because they <clears throat> because their their work is their work in affordable housing. I respectfully urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and a special thanks to Speaker Corey Johnson for prioritizing the needs of workers. My name is Jordan Weiss, and I have been a member of 32BJ for two years. I live and work on the Upper East Side as a doorman. Uh, prior to this job, I was making $12 an hour with no health benefits. It was very difficult to pay my bills and cover my living expenses. Now, things are more comfortable. Making the prevailing wage, I can go out and enjoy life more than I used to. I don't have to count on every penny I make. I have a retirement plan. I hadn't seen a doctor for 10 years before I got this job. Now that I have full health care benefits and I don't have to pay a dime out of pocket. Building service workers in affordable housing developments deserve to make the same prevailing wage. I hope the city council will pass this bill. Uh, thank you for your time, Council Member Miller. My name is Jonathan Hux, that I'm the Residential Research Coordinator for 32BJ. I want to speak about uh, one way we hope it can be strengthened and respond to some of the concerns that have been raised in this, uh, in this hearing. Uh, in terms of strengthening the bill, uh, the legislation currently sets a 100-unit threshold for buildings to trigger the prevailing wage. Uh, we would like to see this language clarified so that it is clear that the prevailing wage requirements extend to buildings that are part of jointly managed, managed complexes with 100 or more total units. It's frequently the case that a large complex is built and financed in phases uh, rather than all at once. Uh, it would be against the spirit of the bill to carve out buildings that comprise larger developments, and the legislation should be clear that they are included. Um, 
Uh, in terms of the request that there is an AMI carve out of, of 80% that was, that was said earlier, I think the earlier HPD testimony recognized that this has worked in the area wide rezonings. They recognized that uh, while it may take some effort, they, they put forward the $9,300 per, per unit uh, subsidy num figure. Uh, given HPD's testimony, I don't think uh, this, this AMI carve out should be considered. Um, also, in, re in response to the assertion that the bill doesn't sufficiently carve out supportive housing, the bill carves out buildings developed under the supportive housing, lo supportive housing loan program, which is the city's main tool for financing supportive housing, and which provides a clear definition of what supportive housing is. If there are developments that provide some level of services, but with less intensive requirements than SHLP, or developments that set aside fewer units as supportive than, uh, than are required by SHLP, we believe those developments should be, pre should be prevailing wage required. Providing a less rigorous requirement would open up a loophole in this bill that could be easily exploited to exclude projects that can, that can and should pay the prevailing wage standard. I also want to uh, note that HPD uh, said that the, the non-union standard is $44,165 for a, for a porter. That is before payroll taxes, so it's actually $40,185, and a family of four is just over 40% of AMI if they had no benefits and all of that was in uh, their wages. But the also want to be clear that as it stands right now, there's no minimum. That's what HPD is, a, is financing, but they don't say you have to pay that. You, they can pay as little as minimum wage or, or worse at, at moments. Uh, I also want to note that they put forward that a, there was a 150% increase in op operating expenses, expenses at a supportive housing uh, example that they had, and this mathematically, that just doesn't work. Uh, operating, uh, just to finish that point, the op uh, building service workers are only a small piece of the, of the pie, and even if building service workers were all of the pie, it still wouldn't work. So there was a math problem there, and I'll leave my rest, uh, rest of my comments for written. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Regina Thompson, and I have been a member of 32BJ for 15 years. My prevailing wage job has changed my life and continues to be a resource of security for my family. My job has given me the stability of a constant paycheck with yearly increases, and I have security knowing I can afford my rent every month. Unfortunately, my adult children do not have prevailing wage jobs and have been forced to move back home because they cannot afford to live on their own. Before I earned the prevailing wage, I did not have good health insurance. It was tough having to pay a high premium. It was a relief to become part of, 32, of the 32BJ family and rep the, reap the ben benefits of having a good job that pays the prevailing wage. The workers who work in affordable housing buildings like where I live also deserve to live with the same stability I do. No worker should have to live in fear of losing their home or not be able to provide for their family. That is why I am urging you to pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Bitter and member of the committee. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Elpidio Molina. I've been a member, a union member for 32, uh, 31 years. And having a prevailing wage job has made an incredible impact in my family and, and myself. I have been able to sustain my family with one job and no worry about paying rent or bills. There is no better feeling than to be able to support your family with ease. As I get older, I start to think about my life after work. I realize how lucky I am to have a job that pays the prevailing wages. I have been a member, like I said, in, for 31 years, and I have stood up with my union brothers and sisters many times uh, to raise uh, the industry standards and bargain for contracts that lift, up, uh, lift us up. Today, I am proud to stand with my union and 
in solidarity with my, my peers who work in affordable housing. We fought for these standards so that all workers in our industry have, have access to family sustaining wages and benefits. We are the same people. Taxpayer money should not enable uh, a two tiers uh, wages system for building service workers because some, of, some, work, some of them work in affordable housing. I'm really proud to be here in front of uh, elected officials who has shown today that they care about working family. And today, you have a real opportunity to give, to give uh, proper service workers in affordable housing dignity in their workplace and security at home. You have a chance to give people a better life. I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you to, to the panel for your insight and your testimony, and we'll be following up with, with some of the uh, information that you provide as well, Tammy. Thank you. Next panel. Oh, is this? Oh, okay. Okay. And Mark Espinosa, Richard. Leraro? No, Torio. Torio? Can't see the T. Uh, Artist. Artist Brown? Michael Stevenson? Kenya Harper? And Barbara Bonham. She's already there. <laughs> okay, we start at whichever end. Just uh, pull the mic close to you and hit the button. And identify yourself. Good afternoon, Chair Miller. My name is Mark Espinoza and uh, members of the committee. I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Um, I've been a 32BJ member for 12 years, and having a prevailing wage job means that instead of struggling to survive, I'm able to thrive. Prior to getting a job that pays a prevailing wage, I was highly dependent on my family. They helped me with the rent and other necessities. And by family, I mean my parents. Now, instead of going to my parents' house asking for help, I can go there and I can offer help, which, as a child, is great. I don't have to worry anymore. I used to stress about living, about having to worry about enough money at the end of the week, living from paycheck to paycheck. Now, my wife and I, and I say it gladly, my wife and I are saving to buy a home. Not only are we just trying to save to buy a home, we're preparing to start a family. We don't struggle anymore. The choice you make today will change the lives of working families all over this city. You have the opportunity to give working people a leg up, a chance to breathe in this city. Frank Sinatra once said, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I urge you to vote yes and help New Yorkers make it in New York. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and the previous members of the committee. My name is Richard Iorio, and I've been a member for 32BJ for about nine years. I work in an affordable housing cooperative, East River Housing, and my story is evidence that creating good jobs in affordable housing is possible and needed. Having a job that pays my family sustaining wages and benefits has a positive impact on my life. Prior to working at East River Housing, I worked for a school bus management company that didn't offer health insurance. I was forced to give up a raise I desperately needed in exchange for health insurance. No one should have to make that choice. Being paid the prevailing wage means security and not having to choose between putting food on the table or paying health insurance. The best part of my job are the people that live in the buildings I help to maintain. To my coworkers and me, it's not just a job. We have strong relationships to the families in our buildings, 
The residents know we're more than just some guys mopping a floor or changing a light bulb. They respect us and feel proud to have us in their building. As workers, we're happy to be there for these families because of the prevailing wage workers and benefits. We continue to stay in the, these positions for years. We see families grow, kids go off to college, and more people who pass away. When, we're paid a, a, when you are paid a family sustaining wage and benefits, you feel like you belong. You take pride in your work and you feel respected. Other workers like me in affordable housing deserve to work and live in dignity like my coworkers. I respectfully urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Chair Miller. On members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you, the speaker, Corey Johnson, for pirate, I can't pronounce that word, but any, I'm working on it, for prioritizing the needs for the workers. My name is Barbara Bonham. I have been a member of 32BJ for 19 years. I work as a cleaner in Midtown. Before this job, I didn't have health care. Now my life is better. Making the prevailing wage, I'm able to pay my bills and take care of my family members and that need help. Because of my health care, I can afford to see a doctor that I like. I have a job stability and these workers and the workers as affordable housing developer deserve to have that too. I hope that the city council passed this bill today. And over the years, I worked for um, H and R Block for 12 years, just to make ends meet to take care of my family. And I'm a co and I worked the pole for 13 years for my grandkids. I helped. All my families, I'm a Southern woman. I believe in helping children with education and old people. And I give most of my money, I give percentage to the church for the children education, and I send money to the South to help old people to make ends meet. God bless you, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Stevenson, and I'm a school cleaner in the Bronx, and I live in Queens. I've been through this fight. A few, a few years ago, my coworkers and I fought to make prevailing wage ourselves. We were doing the same work as others cleaners, but made less money. I had to work two jobs to try to make ends meet. It kept me away from my family, and by the time I got home, I was burnt out. These billing service workers in residential buildings are doing the same work as others, and they deserve to make prevailing wage. I hope the city council passes this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Artis Brown, and I have been a member of 32BJ for 32 years. The most impact having a prevailing wage job has had on my life are the health benefits. My family has needed to use these benefits many times throughout the years. About 10 years ago, my wife needed to be hospitalized and have emergency surgery. Our health insurance took care of everything. There was no out-of-pocket cost, and she had access to some of the best doctors in the world. For 32 years, my family and I have benefited from having a job that pays the prevailing wage. As I approached retirement, I told myself I would dedicate, excuse me, the last 10 years of my working life to fighting with the union that has fought so hard for my, peer, for my peers and me. I am honored to stand before you today in solidarity with property service workers and affordable housing and urge you to please pass this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you to the speaker, Corey Johnson, for prioritizing the needs of workers. My name is Kenya Harper. I am a 
I have been a 32BJ member for six years. I am a security officer and I live in Harlem. Before I got my current job, I was making just above minimum wage with no benefits. I had to decide if I was going to pay certain bills or buy my children a pair of sneakers. I was on public assistance for food and health care. Now I can work without worry, without worrying too much, and it makes it better for me at work. I am able to do more for my children. I have alopecia and I went undiagnosed for years because I couldn't go to the right doctors. Now I can see specialists. So now, um, excuse me, no one should have to struggle like that. Everyone should be paid the prevailing wage and people need to be able to go to the doctor. This is why I'm here to fight for building service workers and affordable housing developments to, to be paid the prevailing wage. I hope you pass this bill, thank you. Thank you, thank you to the members of the panel and, and especially for reaffirming um, your positions and, and, and your struggle here because sometimes that gets lost, right? When we, we kind of move on and I recall uh, being out there for a number of years with, with uh, school cleaners and, and making sure that um, we had parity and that that was a struggle that, that, that made a difference in lives and that story needs to be told, so thank you. Our final panel will be Raymond Perez, Fabian Campbell, Yvette Cumberbatch. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And I want to uh, special give the thanks to Speaker Corey Johnson for prioritizing um, uh, the needs of the workers. Uh, my name is Raymond Perez. I have been a member of 32BJ for 22 years. I work as a handyman in a Mitchell Lamas building in East Village. And I also live in the East Village. Before I had this job, I could not support myself. I was making jobs above minimum wage. And one time I remember I had this terrible ear infection that not only gave me the pain that I had to go through work for several days, but it also took me two years to pay off that treatment. Making the prevailing wage substantially changed my life. I can not only support myself, but I can support my two kids and now recently helping out with the grandkid. As a handyman in affordable housing, I have a great relationship with the tenants. They are almost like extended family. Because of the stability of my job, I have seen kids growing up in my building become responsible adults. And to this day, we remain in touch. These other workers in affordable housing development do the same job I do and they deserve to make the prevailing wage. I hope the city council pass this bill. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the committee. My name is Fabian Campbell and I've been a proud member of 32BJ for three years. I'm currently a maintenance worker in, at a residential building in the Fada District and I live in the Bronx. When I think about what having a prevailing wage job means to me, I think about all the security it provides for me and my family. As a husband and a father to four sons, I, I strive to make an example for them on what it is to have a good job and to provide for your family. I am able to sustain my household, pay bills, and save a little money, and spend time with my, my four sons that I'm working to bring up in this city to be fine young men. My goal today is to help to bring awareness to the needs of families in the city and what prevailing wage jobs provide. 
I do not struggle to provide for my family, and I'm not worried about being able to give them the time that they need. I feel good knowing that I could provide without working multiple jobs or giving up precious family time. You have the opportunity today to ensure that property service workers in affordable housing have access to upward mobility and security. I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Marilyn Vasquez, and I have been a member for 26 years. I work as a cleaner in Midtown, and I live in the East Village. Having a prevailing wage job means being able to provide for my daughter. I'm able to pay my mortgage and have extra money in my pocket to send my daughter to college. Before I had this job, I didn't have the health insurance I have now. With the health insurance I have now, I can take my daughter to the doctor or the, the emergency room without having to pay the, a high cost. I know the difference making the prevailing wage makes, and I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you to the members of 32BJ who, who persevered and stayed around to tell your story and to ensure that your voice is, is heard here. Um, today, we had an opportunity to hear uh, several pieces of le legislation, 1321, 1604, 108, Reso 40, and uh, Reso 898 was not heard. Again, that was the farm workers. It was re withdrawn because the farm, there was an agreement finally, and um, those workers will receive the dignity and respect that they deserve. Um, it, it is a pleasure for this committee to be just a small part of that victory as well. Uh, we um, appreciate all the testimony that is given here as we move forward with the passage of this legislation. It will all be taken into consideration and many of you will be brought back to the table as we discuss further um, how we make this legislation a reality. And so I want to thank everyone who testified here today. I want to once again thank uh, council staff and uh, certainly uh, Malcolm and Kevin still hanging around there for, for, for the work that you've done. But um, believe it or not, the work that you will do <laughs> um, uh, in summarizing what has taken place and as we move forward with this very, very important legislation that was going to impact not just the lives of the workers, but the services that they're delivering to communities, families, and the city of New York. So I'm grateful to everyone for um, your participation in this hearing. Uh, once again, thank you to my staff. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Ooh. Yeah, you can say that again. <laughs>